We don't know. We might have gotten accidentally a money line turtle. Tortoise. Tor- tor- is it tortoise? He's a tor- Russian tortoise. All tortoises are turtles. So is that we, true? Can we say tor- Max only? So oh well, Max. Jesus, Max he's told a, you that. He's a, he's All tortoises guy. are turtles. Well, where'd you find that out? All tortoises. No, are no, no, no. On today's part of my take, we have a two for for the people. A great NBA preview for the playoffs. We have. Head coach of the Denver Nuggets, Mike Malone, who we had on last year. Great guy. Great interview. And Michael we, Malone. Michael Malone. Whoa. Fuck, I already fucked it up. Michael Malone. We said we would protect him. Uh, and then we also have head coach of the Boston Celtics, Joe Missoula, who I'll just say must listen interview because he won us all over. He's the uh, man. Yeah. We're uh, going to talk play-ins. We're going to get Hank's draft big board. He actually came QB. through with it. QB just QBs? QB big board. I want. I thought it was top 10. No. It you was top 10. I was replacing Billy's QB bracket. Oh, okay. All right. So we're going to get his QB big board. He's watched the film. We got Firefest, and we're going to do a redemption pick with Mr. Pear, the worst gambler of all time. And it's all brought to you by our friends at DraftKings. NBA fans, listen up. You've got to try Pick 6, the newest real money fantasy app from DraftKings, an official partner of the NBA. Getting started is simple. Select if a player will have more or less of a stat. For example, will a player have more than one rebound or will a player have less than three and a half assists? You can do it all. We got play-in games. We got the Pelicans versus the Kings. We got the Bulls versus the Heat on Friday night. So pick your favorite players. Compete for huge cash prizes. Download the new DraftKings Pick 6 app now and get started with code TAKE. New customers can get up to $200 back in pick six credits if you first pick set loses. Only on pick six from DraftKings with code TAKE. The crown is yours with DraftKings. Okay, let's go. Welcome to part of my take presented by DraftKings. Download the new DraftKings Pick 6 app now and get started with code TAKE. New customers can get up to $200 back in Pick 6 credits if your first pick set loses. Only on Pick 6 from DraftKings with code TAKE. The crown is yours. Today is Friday, April 19th and PFT. You like that? The heart? You like that? I do like it. Because if you, if you like that, there's going to be more of that coming. I love you. Yeah, I love that, you too. That, that's how Greg I'm Doyle wishes that interaction right now. Had, yeah. had gone. Yeah. She's like, I'm in love with you, sir. Yeah. We're going to talk about the plans, but we have to talk about Greg Doyle and the cr- most cringeworthy press conference I've ever seen, which, if you didn't hear, can we actually put in the audio? I don't know. I don't think we should do that to the people. Yeah, we're going to put in the audio. Oh, no. This is Greg Doyle uh, talking to Caitlin Clark, her introductory uh, press conference. Hi. Hi. Caitlin. Uh, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Real quick, oh, let me do this. You like you like that? I like that you're here. I like yeah, that you're here. I do that at my family after every game, so. Okay, well, let's cool. start doing it to me, and we'll be able to get along just fine. So, question is. I don't even know. Like, I've watched it so many times. I've cringed every single time. He, went, he did the heart emoji to Caitlin Clark, asked if Caitlin liked it, and then followed up with uh, one of the weirdest things ever. Uh, when he said, "Okay, we'll start doing that to me, and we'll get along just fine." And then, and then he, uh, <laughs> oh, then he, ow! then he wrote a column on it. Yeah. And then he apologized in his column with maybe a weirder column. No, it wasn't as weird as the heart thing, but it was almost as weird. In the column, he was, it was just all about him and how weird he is. Yeah. So I'm gonna read just part of it for you here. Okay. He said, "What happened was the most me thing ever, <laughs> in one way." But by the way, right off the bat, like. Him saying, well, that's just that's just kind of who I am. That's I'm just a weird Greg guy. with three Gs. I'm just Greg being Greg. That's yeah. all. He says, I'm sort of known locally, comma, Psy, comma. <laughs> oh, writing, no. writing out the word Psy. Oh. I'm sort of known locally, Psy, 
for having awkward conversations with people before asking brashly conversational questions. That's his problem. The the conversation was too brashly controversial. No, conversational. Con- conversational he's questions. Bra- he's brashly conversational. Yeah, brashly conversational. <laughs> Good character trait to have for a reporter, Yeah. by the way. I've done this for years with Colts coaches Chuck Pagano, Frank Reich, and Shane Steichen. I've done it with Purdue players Carson Edwards and Zach Eady. I did it with IU's Romeo Langford, talking to them as people, not as athletes. Notice something about all those names? Um, they all... Hmm. People? They're all people. They're all men. Oh! Shit. So he doesn't know how to talk to a woman. I think that that part was clear. Oh, we didn't need yeah, we didn't need you to write a column that you don't know how to talk to a and, woman. And then he said that he went through all the stages of grief. Excuse me, the first two stages of grief after this happened. Okay. Uh mourning his own passing on as uh an interviewer, yeah. I guess. Brashly conversational. He interview. said he said denial. I didn't do anything wrong. I gave Caitlin her signature heart-shaped hand gesture as a way of introducing myself and welcoming her to town. I did this during a nationally televised press conference. What kind of idiot acts creepy on national television? Me. And then he was in anger, and he said, this is how I talk to everyone. This is how I... Uh, this, the male equivalent would be talking to uh, Anthony Richardson. I have shown him the heart gesture and reiterated, I like that you're here. Oh, and then that's he, but, creepy but then, too. But then don't worry. He had a conversation with a woman. Oh, thank God. So he talked Name to a woman, Greg Doyle. He talked to a woman, uh, someone that he trusts that's close to him, and they told him that you can't talk that way to a young woman. There's a line, and he crossed it. I now realize what I said and how I said it was wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, it was just wrong. Caitlin Clark, I'm so sorry. Oh, so, y- you know what the craziest part is? He had another p- part in that press conference that was almost equally as cringeworthy where he asked the indiana fever head coach he said so you get the keys to that what are you gonna do with it <laughs> you'll be able to drive that thing? i mean it was it, that was it, it, like that would have led every story but then he obviously did the heart thing do that what was it wait okay we'll start doing that to me and we'll get along just fine he asked the coach like that might be too much woman for you yeah that you have a keys to that Damn, what I wouldn't that give, thing over take there. that thing out for a spin. It was it was very strange, although it did make me think that when the Bears draft Caleb Williams, you should go to his press conference and show your fingernails. Yeah. Be like, like you like that? Be like if you come if you come cry in my arms yeah. after a loss, we'll be just fine. Yeah, if you paint my fingernails, Caleb, we'll we'll get along just fine. The So it's obviously not the worst thing that's been done. It's probably the most cringeworthy thing that's been done. But the problem with Greg Doyle is he is uh one of the captains of the Scold Kings online. So when you're a scold king mm-hmm. and you mess up, we get to dunk on you, buddy. Mm-hmm. We get to dunk on you over and over and over and over again. And it it was great because you're a fucking idiot. And that was so cringeworthy. You like that? Do more of that. What he should have done, he should have just disassociated himself from that conversation and then wrote a column pretending it was somebody that he doesn't like. That said that. Yeah. You should have pretended it was Dan Dockich did that to Caitlin Clark oh. and then write the column about Dan Dockich and then do find and replace and substitute Greg Doyle in for everything. Dan Dockich is getting to do a, a, a well deserved victory tour because he's had a long, long yeah. history with Greg Doyle. My ass. My ass. Uh, also, Greg Doyle, he uh, had, I think, his old tweets started to resurface. And uh, here's one from 7 8. 2010 which i listen i don't love the old tweets thing but again he is the scold king he is the person who would do this to other people yes he would be like cancel this person for saying this 2010 uh, was was truly though agreed. everyone a uh, way long ago again i'm not i'm not judging on the tweet i'm judging on the cringeworthy press conference but i just wanted to share it with you just realized my lebron column references masturbation gangbangs and oral sex damn i'm twisted that was the decision <laughs> that, that was the decision that was a decision. Yeah, calling yourself so twisted is t- calling yourself twisted is actually the worst part of this. I've got a twisted sense of I'm humor. I'm so twisted. I'm kind of edgy sometimes when I talk about LeBron. Yeah, warning Gang bangs. He's the kind of guy that will put a warning at the start of his call. Warning: these this column contains some serious hot takes. Yeah, if that offends you. Click the backwards button. Warning: This author has been accused of being twisted by himself. And then he does the uh, the emoji, the old school emoji, where it's. The, uh, I guess that would be the greater than sign and then the colon and then the smiley face. So it looks like a guy that's smiling, but he's, he knows that he's just said something that's a little bit out of bounds. Damn. You like that? Do more of that and we'll get along just fine. (laughs) So funny.
fucking weird. All right, we had to lead the show with that because I, I've just been laughing. The, the, again, it comes down to the fact that he, he – remember, we talked about him a couple weeks ago because he had the column after Purdue lost the national championship game that essentially uh, Danny Hurley's an asshole – and Purdue has all the class. Yeah, that's that's where we're that's where we're coming from with this twisted mind of Greg Doyle. Yeah, Greg Doyle, and then Caitlin Clark got a shoe deal announced right after that yes. for eight figures, which is I think now she's going to be paid more than she was at Iowa officially, yeah. right? So she's making upwards of what? What, what do you think eight figures is? Ten. It's somewhere 10, between 10 somewhere fifths? between ten and ninety nine. Yeah, I I am enjoying um the burning brush fire tire fire uh online right now of just a bunch of people getting in debates about the economics of a league and no one actually having any expertise on it yeah it's very fun yeah it is people <laughs> are, are are showing that they don't understand how uh how the economy works yeah it's because great. some people are saying that the WNBA players are paid too low and then they're comparing them uh to nba players and showing what percentage of revenue the players get in the NBA or how much money they get it's way less. And so, but NBA players obviously make way more money than WNBA players, but the league revenue is much higher. So at the same time, they're making the argument that NBA players should actually be paid more yeah. for what they're bringing, but their salaries are artificially deflated by the collective bargaining agreement that they have. So it's just, NBA it, players are fine. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm saying like they, they make good money. But if you were to see like the percentage in league revenue compared to salaries, it's just fun. fun it, the NBA also on. brings in a fuckload of money. Everyone's going after everyone. I've just been like diving into. Yeah, Ravel is just sticking with his that Caitlin Clark would have had a shoe deal at Iowa and all this stuff. We also had. I saw real quick with Ravel, his new company. When I first saw his company, yeah. I thought it was called Clit. Yeah, I thought the name of his company was Clit. You're twisted. I'm a little bit twisted. <laughs> But I, you see, I know it's got an extra C in there. Yeah. But every time I see it, I'm just like Darren Ravel owns the clit. Yeah. It's yeah, he does. He owns the clit. We, there, but it's just been every. It's basically the Avengers of the internet just going at each other. Like Jamel Hill was going at G G Doug Gottlieb, which that's a fun fight. And then someone was calling him Got Dweeb, which I loved. Mm -hmm. Like this is just the kind of stuff that's going on right yeah. now, all because of Caitlin Clark. When we really should be focusing on. Greg Doyle doing the heart. Jamel Hill has the race card, and then Doug Gottlieb stole it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But he wrote an apology. Yes. So it's fine. Uh, all right, playing games. The Chicago Bulls have advanced to the Friday night game, and the Philadelphia 76ers are officially inside the playoffs. Congratulations, Max. Congratulations, Max. You made it. We'll get to Mr. Pair later. Uh, but, Max, thoughts on the game? You guys, th that was a very – Classic heat, muck it up, make everyone look bad, almost steal one, but uh, Joel Embiid just starts hitting some threes and, and the Sixers are going to the playoffs against the Knicks. Yeah, no, uh, that's a game that the Sixers lose 10 times out of 10 with Doc Rivers and last year's team. Oh. Um, Nick Nurse actually can make an adjustment. Halftime adjustments were very good. And Nick uh, Nick Batum, absolute beast! Like what what a performance from Nico Batum! He was a legend. And shout out the chicken. Yeah, the free chicken. Shout out the free chicken. Free chicken turned it all around oh, for you yeah. guys. Oh yeah, the stadium was absolutely dead. They looked like shit. I think Caleb Martin missed two free throws. Free chicken for the crowd. Immediate run. Sixers never looked back after the chicken. Shout out the chicken. Yeah, that, that made all the. We should do something on this show where free chicken, like yeah. free a uh, free part of my cheesesteak. Buffalo chicken cheesesteak. Yeah. Hank falls asleep on the podcast. Yeah, I like that. Or he, or he doesn't wake up. Uh, yeah, Batum was awesome. Um, I saw a great analogy for, for uh, Nick Batum. This is from Screaky Shooter. He said, Nick Batum is the LeBron James of Tobias Harris's. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pretty much perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. I mean, Tobias Harris still was absolutely terrible. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. It's yeah. like you expect one thing from Tobias Harris, and you get the LeBron James of Tobias Harris is coming up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was awesome. Both sides of the court absolutely kept us in it. And then Embiid at the end of the game, finally he has a, a, like a good moment in a, in a must-win game that those last three possessions where he went three and one. Yeah, and then and then the pass to to Ubre to get another and one. Now, I have to ask this question, Max. So the Sixers are favored in the series against the Knicks. Giannis, we don't know when he's going to uh, 
come back and play. That might be a problem for the Bucks against the Pacers in their first round matchup. Is the East opening up for the Sixers? Uh, no, I mean, the Knicks are a really good team. The Nova Knicks, it hurts that I'm going to have to go against my boys like this. But um, it's kind of opening up for the Sixers. Yeah, it, it's all about Embiid's health. Like, you can even see last night that he wasn't at 100%. He gutted it out towards the end, but it's, it's a long playoffs. It's yeah, a long playoffs. You said six, Sixers and five, right? I no longer think Sixers and five. Oh. I do think the Sixers, the Sixers will win. You forgot about the Nova Cats. Yeah. The Nova yeah. Cats are the the Nova, Nova Knicks. Uh, also, Max, you brought up a good point. Embiid finally has a big moment in uh, a playoff game. Unfortunately, the playing games do not count at I all. I didn't say playoff game. I said must win. Like oh, must win, game. but it doesn't count. So it actually doesn't. He didn't have that. No, he did. No, but none of these stats. Also, record, yeah, the also, record books. We've talked about this for that. three years. Yeah, the playing game. Regular season I watched it. Playoffs. Kobe White had it. his his career high in forty two points. Does not count. I watched it. So, but the stats don't exist. Though. Playing yeah. game legend. Play, yeah, I guess. But I don't I even guess think. So, I think once the playing game happens, you can't even. You have to pretend it never happened. It's also by definition not a must win. If they had lost this game, true, they would have gotten to play another game. Good point. True. But that was such a game that everyone was like. So dialed in to be like, uh oh, playoff Embiid's back. He, he, he has still he not the playoffs. He still doesn't understand. No, Moscow but you guys, I mean, that would be the, the narrative playoffs. right now. Still doesn't understand. That would Moscow. be the narrative not, right now. It was not a must win. PFT, he still doesn't understand. Still Moscow. doesn't get it. Still but doesn't get it. Max, I, I'm with you that I've been, I've been buying in on the Sixers. I because like if you look at the bracket and look oh. how it shakes out for him, for the reasons we just went through, Hank, because Giannis is going to be limited. Plus they have Doc Rivers, and then <laughs> the Knicks. The Knicks they don't they don't have uh, Randall and they're a 500 team without Randall, so it feels like the Sixers get an Embiid back. I was very high on the Sixers. That first half, especially though, last night did not make me confident in them. Yeah, no, but that, I mean that's the but Heat the coming in, coming in with a good game plan, making things sloppy. You're gonna have bad halves of basketball like that, but it's good to see a, like them bounce back for once. That like. Against we've had halves like that against the Celtics, and then they just win by fifty. Yeah. Like like bad first halves, they look sloppy, and then they just give up. And it was nice to see that they didn't give up. They made an adjustment, look good in the second half, mm-hmm. switch some things up, put Tobias Harris on the bench, put Nick Batum in the in the rotation. It was it was good to see. It was good to see it. And B can get a little bit more healthy. Maxi didn't have his A game. Only th- things are looking up. Things are looking up. Okay, so, Hank, from your perspective. I'm curious to know, as a Boston fan, who would you rather play in the first round? The Bulls. Yeah, the Bulls. You Why go the to Bulls? A game and you want to punish me? Why the Bulls? Uh, no, I mean the Heat. Obviously, you know, have had success against us. No, Jimmy Butler. No, I know, but still, it's like you just don't just don't mess about with the them? Heat. Yeah, don't yeah. mess with it. If you play the Bulls, it's much better. I can go to a couple games. Dick w- said he's going to come with me. Yeah. Um. You, so I'd much rather play. Did the he Bulls. say that? Yeah, I said I, I did actually say okay. I would go to one game. Um, the you just want the free win, which it would be a free win, but that's okay. Yeah, and it's like just don't don't tempt fate. Like, you just want the free win. I just want the free win, and I'm, I'm and I want to go to a game. I'm stuck in a spot where the Bulls were awesome against the Hawks, who are an unserious organization. That's just don't they don't they, believe in defense. They mm-hmm. do not yeah. believe in defense. Also, Trey Young is their quote unquote best player. The only time I was nervous during that game was when Trey Young was on the bench, because uh, that's when they kind of came back in the game a little bit. And it's I'm stuck because I love Kobe White. He was awesome. I O come back. He was awesome. Uh, Demar Derozan like is one of the most likable guys out there. And Played the most minutes in the league. This yeah, I mean he's the best. And they try so hard, and they don't have a ton of talent. And so I, when they get on the court, I'm like, I want these guys to win. But then I remember that Jerry Reinsdorf likes nothing more than getting a couple extra playoff game uh, ticket gates for a team that has no chance of winning. Mm-hmm. But at least he's going to contribute that money towards his other organization, the the White Sox. Well, actually, unfortunately uh, for the future of the Bulls and the White Sox, Jerry Reinsdorf probably spent all the money last night because he uh, got sea red towels for everyone on their seats and Red Panda. Oh, so Red Panda is coming. That budget is probably blown. Yeah. It's probably, him. but he, it's he it, knows what the fans want. Yeah, it is a, a very like shitty situation where it's like I know they're not good enough. They could maybe win a game against the Celtics, and I also know that Jerry Reinsdorf nothing would make him happier than being like, "See, we made the playoffs, mm-hmm. and we got two extra games at home to make money." Um, but then they get on the court, and I, those guys like it's hard not to root for those guys who are trying really hard. Yeah, Kobe White seems like a good dude to root for. Oh, he was awesome, awesome. And, and yeah, and DeMar DeRozan is the best. 
Like, he's just, he's the best. So we'll see what happens on Friday night. We'll see what happens. No Jimmy Butler. Probably no Alex Caruso. I'm, I I honestly just, if my if I had to give you my take on the game, it's going to be a one possession game with three minutes left, and then who the fuck knows. How about Jimmy Butler playing, though? Yeah. Like playing on a, a sprained MCL. Yeah. Pretty, pretty impressive. But then it swells up, it gets worse, so he's probably out for the playoffs. Yeah, they said two to three weeks, so. Damn. Oh. It's just all breaking for Hank. He's just got that Hank smile on his face. All right, you know what? Let me get this Hank smile off your face. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Your football owner's a fucking dickhead. Yeah. So the report comes out after the Dynasty documentary where Robert Kraft does an entire 10-part documentary essentially tearing down Bill Belichick. Uh, we're like, all right, enough, enough, enough. The report comes out that Bill Belichick, part of the reason why he didn't get a job this year was Robert Kraft called Arthur Blank and essentially was like, he's really difficult to deal with. Don't hire him. So in the response to it, I think the Krafts said that uh, they did not say anything negative about Belichick during that interview process, but owners might talk behind the scenes over the course of a frustrating season. It would have been funny if he just came out and he's like, I did not say anything to Arthur Blank. All communication with Arthur Blank was done through Kraft LLC. Yeah. Not, not my words. <laughs> not my words. So where are you? This is tough because it does feel like Robert Kraft is like kicking a dead body at this point. Like why why would you go that extra mile? Like you, the breakup happens. Why go the extra mile and make sure that he doesn't get another job? That's crazy to me. Yeah, I feel like he there like it's kind of the same thing with Brady where they in the documentary they made it seem like you know Brady just wanted like some attaboys and some some thank yous like it was probably the same with Kraft where he felt slighted for whatever reason just ego but what and yeah. Belichick's not the type of guy to be like thank you so much Robert like and and kind of kiss the ring because he was giving him the rings yeah um but he's he sounds like a a, a scorned ex yeah he's had a bad off season I would say. It hasn't gone exactly how he thought it would go. And he's entering territory where it's like he's going to start getting like booze, which is insane. But like he is he has set himself up for that where they're going to do an event. Maybe like it's like Tom Brady, like the Tom Brady. They're doing Tom Brady Day 612. Um, and I think they're giving him a statue or, or whatever at Gillette. And I could see there being like booze or, or something where like that's going to that's going to rattle. Him. It but he's done it to himself. And it happens in sports from time to time where the owner deludes themselves and thinks that they actually are what fans are rooting for. And it's like that's just never the case. It was always Brady and Belichick. It's never the case. And yeah, I don't it, it sucks because now I mean, he's he's set himself up for for disaster because it's like they have a four and a half you know, win total over under this year, they're not going to be good and everyone's just going to come at his neck. Oh, that, that statue unveiling is going to be a big day for you, though. You have to nail that one. Yeah, they got to give him a bigger statue than AI. I mean, they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll, 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 do, they'll yeah. do it right. Yeah, the AI statue. That was, oh, no, that, that was, was bullshit. Joke. That no, was joke that, that was bullshit. Tiny little statue. Every single statue. Tiny stat little statue. If I, listen, Every as a fan of, of the Commanders, we, if there's yeah. one thing that we can do well that's honor our former players with statues. Correct. And that AI statue was... Garbage. That's every statue that goes into the garbage. Pra practice. So they're so all garbage. But garbage. why? Why is Rocky get such a big? Statue? And why? Oh, because, because that's, that's an it's not in front of the <laughs> practice facility. Rocky's not even real. Yeah, it's not in front of the practice facility. You, th this was like a bad take that the internet didn't know that all the other statues in front of that facility existed. And then they were like, "Fuck." Are you saying we don't I'm know still, statues? I'm sticking with the, I'm sticking with the take. Why saying... don't they just get bigger statues for everyone? They just don't value any. Also, why do they it. unveil it that it's, way? It's an aesthetic. Yeah, but don't you unveil guys don't it know, that way. You guys don't know uh, architecture. Don't, uh, don't, don't know architecture. <laughs> don't unveil yeah. it that way. Then don't do the fucking reveal like that when it's like, oh, that's why did that? AI seem so surprised? Yeah, he was shocked. AI is always surprised. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not architecture. It's a statue. It's not a building we're talking about. It's it's a it's an aesthetic. You for don't the appreciate the, the greatness that Allen Iverson brought to the city of Philadelphia. Landscaping architecture. Of course, I come on. I grew up on AI. That was that was like the first fan I ever was of anyone. Landscaping and architecture. Y yeah, landscaping architecture. I think that's a thing. You weren't a Look fan of your dad first. What? First jersey you ever bought was AI. I don't know. Everyone that was the first jersey I had too. Fan of their dad. I also first. had a Brett Favre jersey. Wayne Corbett. Do you ever take a picture yeah. in that Brett Favre jersey with your cock out? I was like four. <laughs> so probably. <laughs> so probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so honestly, yeah. Probably the same size I as Brett, a, too. I was a naked boy, too. <laughs> I was a boy who loved to be naked. <laughs> big, big, meaty clankers. Oh, naked Max. <laughs>
Quick break. I'm, it's only going to take 20 seconds, so you should buy, 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 buy. Rough and Rowdy tonight in West Virginia. We have 20 new fights, 20 new fights. I'm telling you, this is going to be incredible. This is how new legends are made. Rough and Rowdy, West Virginia, 20 new fights. We have 40 new people, so it's going to be chaos. There are going to be knockouts. I'll be on the call. I got a brand new suit for the people. I'm doing the anthem. Buy buy rnr.com right now buy rnr.com it's going to be awesome we've had a bunch of old fighters in the past shout out all those guys but tonight we're going new blood we're going to get new storylines we're going to get new chaos we're going to get new weirdos it's going to be incredible if you got nothing to do tonight buy rnr.com even if you have something to do buy rnr.com support us it's going to be awesome back to the show all right so hank uh you have your draft prep because we have draft week coming up. We have Todd McShay coming on the show on Monday, and then we have Daniel Jeremiah on Wednesday. Do you have your draft prep ready? Yes. Or internally? Yes. Okay. This is a big occasion for you. How do you want me you to actually, or Do you actually, one of these guys is going to be your quarterback? Yeah, so I broke down the film for everyone. I, I didn't, I mean, I can rank them right now. I have just kind of notes on everyone, and I do have my consensus of who I would prefer the Patriots to take. Your own consensus? Your personal consensus? Okay. Well, yeah. You, know, you, you, can trust, the you can trust the analysts out there, but like until you make your own decision. Do you know what a consensus is, though? Yeah, it's me, myself, and I made a came to a consensus. All okay, right, so, so do it in order then, right? Yeah, do it in reverse order so we can get the unveil of number one. So start at the start at the bottom and then go go to one. Okay. JJ McCarthy. That's he's the bottom. He's the bottom. He's the he's the he's the bottom of this entire exercise. So Michael Pratt is ahead of him. Spencer Rattler's ahead of him. Oh, I just did that. I did that. I thought I was going for the people the Patriots are going after. Oh, top five. Oh, okay. okay so top five. I'm not. I'm not worried. Like it's it's number okay. five. I thought we were getting all the quarterbacks. The Patriots aren't drafting Spencer Rattler. Okay, at three. Why not? So, yeah. Why not? Because that's just not. Wait, what you wouldn't know. You didn't watch the tape. <laughs> Is he? I think he's dating Caitlin Clark. I saw an Instagram comment. Definitely not. Okay. okay. Maybe not. All right. Greg Connor Doyle. McCaffrey. Greg Doyle is dating McCaffrey's son in his head. All right. So wait, Hank. You have you have your top five, which means that you must have watched the film on the other quarterbacks if you knew that these were the top five. Good point, PFT. <laughs> How many? I'm, what's the other quarterbacks I'm supposed to watch? Um, Michael Penix. Watch him. Bo Nix. Didn't watch. Uh, <laughs> Bo, Bo Nix. Who is Bo Nix? <laughs> no, like he's where, he, he, where's Bo Nix projected to go? Probably like could be a first rounder, probably a second rounder. Okay, probably should have watched him. Okay, I got Bo Nix. I mean, I got Michael Penix Jr., JJ McCarthy, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. Okay, okay, sorry. So JJ's your fifth. JJ's my fifth. And what are your notes? Short throws. Okay. <laughs> everything across the middle, but okay. throws it well across the middle. Okay. Uh, better zip than Drake May. That's a that was that was a big contributing factor. Okay. I, I really I really care about. The zip and how quickly the ball comes out. Okay. Uh, gutsy runs, big ball sack. Okay. Okay. All right. Number four. Wait, wait. But those are all those are all positive traits. Why is he ranked number five? What's his downside? These other guys must be incredible. He doesn't throw. He didn't see any long balls or all the long Short balls throws. were wide Short open. Throws. Okay. Short, Short throws. throws. He was. It's a which again. You know, you kind of watch it. It's like he's seen the. He, he was a game manager, system quarterback. How, how long was the U, YouTube uh, video that you watched? Thirteen minutes. Okay, all right. That's a good amount of film. Mm -hmm. Um, number four. It's Drake May. Oh, oh he, dropped, he slid. He's deceptively fast. Okay, Quick, right. Quicker than I expected. <laughs> uh, great at selling pump fakes. That's good. Yeah. Sliding. He's smart. Uh, Jane Daniels, there was a lot of runs. He was taking a lot of hits. Drake May, a lot of slides. Like, gets out of the pocket and moves around well, but slides. Knows knows when to slide. That's good. You know, franchise quarterback. You want him there for a long time. Yep. Can't be taking big hits. Yep. This does he, does he try to kick his opponents in the balls when he slides? I didn't see any of that. Okay, because that would be a good system fit for you guys. Um. Well, no, we you know we got we got rid of him, and that was that was Robert Kraft. Belichick wanted uh wanted him out. Quick feet. Okay. But this this was the biggest the biggest deterrent and and the thing that I see happening the most. The ball seems very heavy in his hands. Oh, so he's got weak wrist, maybe. It just that. it just seems like it takes him a long time to get the ball up and out, and it seems like he's putting a lot of effort into throwing it. It seemed you know he's playing in the ACC. The film that I was watching, if you're you know simulating NFL guys coming at him, it seems like he's going to take a lot of hits. 
guys are coming at him. He's not going to be able to get the ball out fast enough because it's heavy in his hands. Ball heavy in his hands. How do you like his frame? It's a little short, but good frame. No, no issues with his frame. I don't think he's that see, short. I don't know. Remember that picture he took with no, Sam Howell? He's, he's actually six four. Looks short in the film that I was watching. <laughs> okay, all right. But yeah, that was that was. The ball seems I like. I want. I want to. I want to see a QB. No was world hit. short. I want it. Well, it's like the, that's the perfect size for a quarterback. Yeah. No. I guess if you know what, if he was doing which quarterback could play in the NBA, six four would be short. But yeah. if he was that big, you'd think that he would be able to just zip the ball out. It's heavy. Okay. In his hands. Got it. Memes okay. had this exact same take. Like, heavy in his um, hands? No. He was like he was like Drake May's too short to be a good quarterback. And <laughs> I looked it up. I was like, he's six four and he's like, Well, he looks short. Okay. Like Play- we had this exact conversation. Short energy. He plays shorter than his body. Okay. All right, next. Uh Michael Penix Jr. I think he he the only reason he's he's this far up is just because he's a lefty. I'll I'll just say that bias, lefty bias. I would just love to have a, a lefty quarterback, you know, leading my franchise as a lefty myself. So yeah. beautiful throwing motion, accurate. Does a little bit of a heavier ball uh, as well, a little slower coming out. Seems a little bit interception prone. A lot of a lot of throws off his back foot, which again you're trying to simulate how this would look in the NFL. Guys coming at him. If he has time to set his feet, he's accurate. But it seems like he will kind of you know get a little wild, throw off his back foot, throw a duck. He does okay. the fadeaways, but the thing yeah. about his fadeaways are they're insanely accurate. Like he will put the ball on a dime on an out route, even though he's falling away from the ball. But that's one of those things when you're you know playing in college and you're the guy that works when you're playing in the NFL and everyone's fast. That's not going to work. Yeah. But he's okay. a lefty, so he, he he got bumped up above Drake May. Yeah, I think lefties look Little good bias. in college, but yeah. they look like witches in the NFL. Yeah, Tua though, Tua good or bad, it's good. Okay, and yeah, uh, Jane Daniels is number two. Oh no, that well, Caleb Williams is number one. Oh, nice. Okay, Jane Daniels. I I didn't even watch. I I just <laughs> <laughs> we're not. You've told me a million times we're not taking Caleb Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of this as just like. Patriots. Patriots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jane Daniels throwing on the move. Great, great on the move. Quick feet. Gets out of the pocket. Maneuvers, maneuvers, uh, sacks and, and stuff well. Does take a lot of hits. Little Josh Allen, smaller though than Josh Allen. That's definitely a concern. Again, franchise quarterback. You want this guy as your as your QB for 10, 15 years. He scrambles a lot, takes a lot of hits. That's that's a concern. But Great, fantastic, the best QB I've seen at, at hitting the sideline in the corner of the end zone. Oh, okay. Like JJ McCarthy just throws everything over the middle. Jane Daniels, deadly accurate to the corner of the end zone, deadly accurate to the sideline. That's huge in the NFL. That's that's the thing I like the most. What about uh, his elbow? Elbow's weird, Did but you ding him. I definitely ding him for the elbow. And yeah. and again, it's like if you get hit, and you get hit in the elbow, then what yeah. explode? Like yeah. Just, yeah. This is um you could see his bone coming out of his arm. This has been a great exercise for one reason. Um Hank has just without realizing admitted that he really wishes he could have both of our quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And also said that the quarterback that he's most likely going to get is ranked either 4th or 5th. Mhm. So, I love this exercise. This won't hurt. Is Ryan Thomas Jr in the draft was another question I had cuz he's well, you a stud. You what are we Google? No, I just that I was I have to I I guess I didn't do my follow up. These are just the notes I was writing as I was watching this. Uh, um, I don't believe so. But that you want him? Yeah, I mean his receivers like I think all of his deep balls were were just wide open. I think that's oh, no, more he just, might be uh, yeah. a receiver, a receiver talent thing. If it were up to me, no, he's not. I, wait, I think we talked about him with McShay. Ryan Thomas? Brian Thomas. Brian Thomas. Yeah. Maybe it's Brian. I was just I was He hearing. said Ryan. Yeah, you I was said listening. Ryan. He well, just I was, said Ryan. I was listening. I was listening to the video. Oh. So it probably was Brian. It is Brian. Okay. Stud. He wait, wait a minute. Stud. He didn't He is in the draft. You didn't watch, you just listened to well, the no, tape. Well, no, I'm saying they didn't have fucking subtitles. I was like Brian, like <laughs> okay, touchdown okay, Ryan okay. Thomas, Brian Thomas. I heard I heard Ryan, but clearly it's Brian. Uh that guy's a stud. <laughs> this is the best draft preview ever. If it were up to me, Marvin Harrison Jr. trade up Michael Penix. That's that's my best case scenario draft. Okay, so you draft you draft Marvin Harrison third overall. Yep, and then you trade up to what? I don't know to get I, to get Ryan Thomas to get Penix Jr. Got it. Penix Jr. probably top ten. 
Is he projected to go top ten? Probably Penix? not. Maybe it depends on if there's I a run he was on quarterbacks. Late first round, but this yeah, ha- it happens likely. from time to time when there's a bunch of first round graded quarterbacks. Once a few of them get drafted, then teams start to freak out, and that's how we ended up with like uh, who is it? Um, Brandon Whedon getting drafted in the first round. Yeah, but it's it teams might have gotten smarter because like Will Levis fell because it was like all right, everyone could just wait and get him in the second round. But yeah. there is that phenomenon of wanting to get that extra year of control too. Yeah. Like the Lamar Jackson trading back up into thirty two and getting him, so that's that's my uh, that's my analysis. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll watch analysis. some more some more film. Maybe we'll, there's other guys that they could trade up for the Spencer Rattlers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He just he, he just it, we just did an entire exercise where he's like, I really want PFT and Big Cats quarterback. So you have you have Caleb number one, mm-hmm. Jaden Daniels number two. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then sounds, a long it sounds like there's a big gap. Big there. gap. Panic shooter. Panic shooter. Uh-huh. Big gap. <laughs> yeah. Drake May, JJ McCarthy, mm-hmm. probably undrafted. But, but but strength, no. Jay, Drake Drake May can be good. He's just gotta he's got the gotta grow. Hand. Yeah, he, has to he grow can a he can inches. he can get some strength there. Yeah, he can do some bicep curls. He just looks like yeah, he looks like he's throwing a medicine ball. Yeah, mm-hmm. he would look short in that Patriots uniform too. Did you watch any of the games that he played in the rain? Is that maybe part of this? Uh, I didn't see many of those on the on the okay. tape I was watching. Mm-hmm. Literal heavy ball. All right, this was great. Do we have anything else before we get to our interviews? This is great. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jonte Porter, that he's gone. Yeah, he was gambling. He was betting against the Raptors in some games. Yeah, like betting on them to lose. Banned. For what life. was this of a? What, what What if this was Jokic? I don't think he'd be banned for life. But I also don't think Jokic would ever do it because he's making enough money that that would be the dumbest thing ever. That That's why it happened. Is he's a fringe guy. Yeah, who, but NBA money is so ridiculous. I don't well, think they, he was getting that much. The money. crazy thing is he was betting parlays against himself. So yeah. he was betting the unders and like rebounds. I forget what else. Maybe assists, points. Um, and he put down eighty grand to win. I think one point one million dollars on a Jonte Porter under parlay. Yeah. And it hit obviously because he was controlling it. And then the sports book was like, well, we're just definitely not going to pay this out. One of the dumbest things ever. One of the dumbest ways to go about it. How much action do you think that that sports books see on any given night on Jonte Porter prop bets in general? Right. It's probably nowhere close to $80,000 ever. Yeah. He was on a two-way, Hank, so he was getting nothing. It, it, I mean, they had to do it. I, I think that's the right move. Like, you can't have someone betting on against yourself. Yeah, so if it had been different, if he had bet his overs in a parlay, and if he had bet on his team to win, and that had that had actually happened, what do you think the punishment would have been? Um, Probably similar because he's a fringe guy. It's also, he was telling other people, too. Like, he was yeah. using proxies to bet him, which that is very, very bad, because then it's just the integrity of the game. So I... Yeah, the NBA probably had to do it. And it also, I know people will then make an argument about gambling and, like, the legalization of gambling. Without the legalization of gambling, this probably never gets caught. Yeah. yeah. Now, you every, could, you could every make, sports book has yeah. things in place where they see these, like, giant anomalies. Yeah. And then they flag them to the league. I wouldn't be shocked if there is maybe a little bit of a correction where some of the uh, fringe players don't have props on a night-to-night basis. That would make yeah. sense just because those are the guys, like, Jokic would never do this because he's making hundreds of millions of dollars, but a guy who's the 10th man on a bench who knows that if he bets something, checks into a game for a minute, and then comes out, he can win. That is, I I can understand where people are like, this is kind of a weird area where it can be manipulated. Yeah, I like his excuse, too. He was saying that he had, like, a headache or his eye hurt yeah. to come out of a game. He got hit in the shoulder, and then he's like, my yeah. eye. Yeah, my eye hurts. Real, my eye hurts so bad I can't play anymore, Coach. <laughs> can't play. Uh, okay. Let's get to our interviews. Incredible interviews. We got Joe Missoula, Boston Celtics head coach, wins us over big time. And then we have Michael Malone, Denver Nuggets head coach. We had him on last year. Great interview. Great guy. Uh, and then we'll do Firefest and we'll have Mr. Pear come back out here. Before we get to Coach Missoula, Coors Light, there are plenty of chances in life to make things better by choosing chill. Grab every opportunity to choose chill, then reach for a refreshing Coors Light. When you embrace a chill mindset, it's a good time to choose chill and crack open a Coors Light. Coors Light is mountain cold refreshment. Crisp and refreshing is the Colorado Rockies. We love Coors Light. There's nothing better than going to a bar, maybe on your couch, maybe in a backyard, cracking open an ice cold Coors Light. Oh, the best. So make the most out of the times you choose to chill. Choose Coors Light. 
Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash take. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado, CoorsLight.com slash take. Okay, here he is, Boston Celtics head coach, Joe Mazzulla. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. It is Boston Celtics head coach, Joe Mazzulla, getting ready for the playoffs, uh, the number one seed, the best team in the NBA in the regular season this year. Coach, let's start there. How are we feeling just vibes going into the playoffs because you've been coaching a team that knew they were the number one seed for a long time, knew that you were in the playoffs for a very long time. Uh, how are we feeling knowing that this is the start of the new season? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on a great point there. Uh, the balance of, you know, you have to understand that you're a really good team, uh, but you got to understand that, like, none of that really matters as much anymore because everyone's got the same record. You know, we're all zero and zero, and uh, every series takes on a life of its own. So uh, we've had a really good week of practice. Uh, I think it was good for us. You know, a couple of those games that we had at the end of the season uh, that didn't necessarily go our way. Uh, but I thought we handled uh, the regular season about as well as you can from a mental standpoint. And, you know, we got to go into the playoffs with that same balance. Uh, we are a really good team, uh, but we can lose at any time if we don't do uh, the little things. And so it's important to have that mindset. Yeah. yeah. Do people think that this season's been easy for you guys just because you've had so much success? Is that something that get, kind of gets lost in it, that it has been a grind? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously on the uh, outside, it probably looks as like, you know, we didn't hit a ton of adversity or, you know, we've only had two game losing streaks. It, it could look that way. But, you know, I kind of said this a few times. It it could be just as hard handling winning uh, as anything else because you can get complacent. Uh, you know, you could get prideful. Uh, you could take the details for granted. And I thought like the, the coolest part about our guys this year is they never took winning for granted. I thought they handled it really well. Like every film session, every walkthrough, every practice we had, there was a high level of attention to detail and execution. And like, even though we were winning, the guys wanted to grow and get better. I think that says a lot about just who they are as players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So enough of the cliche uh, basketball talk. Let's get to the real interview. When was the last time you were choked out? Uh, <laughs> the day after we lost to Atlanta, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I kind of punished myself there. I took it really hard on myself. Um, so can you, ex yeah, can you explain the jujitsu? Cause like it was, that story came out last year. Um, it seemed really cool because it's like just learning about other guys in, in, in the height of their profession. They have these hobbies. You have a jiu-jitsu uh, instructor who for a while you didn't know lived in Colorado and would come at the drop of a hat and, and, and do jiu-jitsu ses sessions with you. And yeah. also he talked about um, feeling the pressure of playoff basketball and it's similar to being in a chokehold. So you're yeah. just you're just getting choked out by this guy who's flying in. You have a guy flying in to choke you out. So we'll we'll start there. So <laughs> when I um the coolest part about you know becoming the the head coach of the Celtics and like you know achieving your dream at a relatively young age, you kind of look back and you look at all the stuff that you regret. And so like two of my biggest not biggest regrets, but like two things I wish I stuck with were chess and martial arts. So I did those as a kid growing up. And, you know, once my dad passed and my kids started to get older, I started to like rekindle the passions of the arts, like chess, piano, martial arts. Um, and I started to rekindle those with my kids. And then I get the job and I'm like, all right, like, you know, coaching the Celtics, you're in a, a fucking fight every day. Like, so let's just simulate that. And I was like, let's rekindle my love of the arts. And so, you know, my assistant and I, we find a jujitsu instructor. And I fell in love with this guy like right away. So apparently he was in Denver when we called his his office was in Boston, but he was living in Denver uh, because of COVID. And we were like, can you come by the house tomorrow for like the, an initial training session? And he just was like, this is a, you know, apparently this is the head coach of the Celtics. It's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'll be there tomorrow. So this guy gets on a red eye and shows up to my house, full gi, black belt, like standing in the dri uh -huh. <laughs> in the driveway. Like we have our first lesson in the guest house, uh, in the guest room of our apartment. And from then on in, he he he's the guy that I go to to help simulate the stress, the pressure, the anxiety, like all the shit that you've got to be able to overcome. Like if you're not doing that as a person, then you can't do it as a coach. And yeah. like, and I like, I give my players, our players, so much credit, like being in the arena all the time. Like, I feel like one of the ways I can connect with them is by feeling like them. So like on a day where if it's a, if it's a back to back, hey, I just train too. So like I'm tired too. So it gives me a, a way to connect with the guys, but it gives me a way of being empathetic. Like I know what they're going through. No coach understands what their players 
go through what they sacrifice physically and mentally. So if I can get the shit kicked out of me from time to time, that's only gonna help me get better. I yeah, like it. I like I like that strategy a lot. And it, for listeners out there, don't do not look up online guys to fly in to come choke me out. That's a bad <laughs> Google search to have on your hey, history. So we, lo- we lose the Atlanta game, right? We blow yeah. the thirty point lead, and I'm just pissed, right? So I go to the the I go to the gym. We find a gym in most cities, and for like two hours, we're just like, I still I still got a little piece of like the black eye from it. Yeah. So <laughs> do do you do that? Um, I, I mean, I, I appreciate what you said about how you want to put yourself through strenuous situations so you can empathize with your players and be tired just like they are. Do you find that the more you get put in those situations where you're either getting the crap kicked out of you or you're getting choked out, uh, you're able to stay calm in those moments? And, and that translates to being in a game in high pressure situations? Yeah, so like one of the things our, uh, Alex does, he's tremendous, is he finds these concepts and themes that correlate to competition in general, right? And so one of the themes is like most people tap before it actually, like before the submission actually hurts, right? It's like the fear of being in the submission is when you tap. And so like that can be applicable to handling uh, championship expectations or success or being mm-hmm. in a tough spot and like, you know, thinking that you can't get yourself out of it. So. You know, it's a little dark, but like one of the things in most submissions is you do want to find a comfort level because there usually is a way out. You just can't see the way out because of the stress that you're under or because of the panic that you're under. So like your breathing skyrockets and you don't even notice the exit strategy because you're in a disadvantaged situation. So that's kind of one of the concepts that we work on is like, okay, you know, you're in this disadvantage. Can you recognize the exits? Can you recognize the contingency plan? You know, using your the the details and the skill. That's badass. Yeah, I would have cool. tapped out the minute he showed up in my driveway. I've been like, <laughs> all right, never mind. I'm yeah. tapping out. Like, I, um, if a man with a black belt and a gi is is knocking on my door, yeah. I, I would just move. Yeah, just start tapping immediately. <laughs> just reverse. Well, two of the other cool two of the other cool themes are like uh, the closer you are to winning, the closer you are to losing. Right. So like you saw it at UFC 300, where uh, Jalen Turner knocks the guy down, walks away, and then loses next round. And then you see, um, you know, when Wei Li Zhang like pretty much chokes her out. And yeah. then as a, like, most people can't handle the fact that you think you beat your opponent, but now you still have to fight them. Oh, and yeah. so we, we like that's a major mindset shift in a game of like, OK, they look like they're dead, but they come back to life. How do you shift your mentality to like keep winning? Or like in Jalen Turner's case, like you knock the guy down, but he gets back up. Now your expectations like haven't been met. Yeah. So yeah. you like so we work a ton of those like situations like, OK, you know, one minute left in the round, you're in a disadvantaged situation. you got to get yourself out of it or like one minute left in the round. you got to go for the kill. Like you've got to find a submission, because if you don't, if you give your opponent life, then, you know, he could come back and kill you. That's I mean, it's genius. You can see how applicable that is to basketball, especially a seven game series where there are those ebbs and flows where it's like a team goes up 2 0 and you're like, all right, they won. And that's just not how it works. It just always there's always a, a wrinkle, and a team can get momentum back. Um, yeah. Wow. All yeah. right. That was a. I mean, it does incredible it, answer. It sounds like Sun Tzu. You mentioned before we started taping, you read Art of War. Or, or do you take like we listen to Art of War when we train? Oh. Do you? What's yeah. What's an Art of War lesson that you can apply to basketball? Uh, so one we use with our offense, like with the guys, is now this is I don't you know this is obviously different from when he wrote it, but like there's only five musical notes, there's only five primary colors, and mixing all those together, you know, having the simplicity of only five, but when you add them all together, you get this beautiful, uh, you know, this this array of colors or the beautiful music, uh, using simplicity to to you know get complexity out of it, um, and really just like how you view your opponents, like you have to have the ultimate respect. The most respectful thing you can do for your opponent uh, is understand that they can beat you at any time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, but, you, but you can't have too much respect, right? Like I think it's a balance, and it kind of talks about our team. So when we were fighting, the first couple months once we started fighting, he stopped around, and he was like, you have too much respect for me. You're better than you think you are, but because I'm a black belt, you're treating me as if you suck. He's like, if you believed in yourself and if you knew that you were better than you were, you would actually, you could have tapped me, you could have beat me a couple of times. And so it was a really cool, like, balance of, like, what humility really is. Like, humility isn't like, oh, I suck and this guy's a black belt. It's like, you got to find the right balance of knowing, like, I'm pretty good, but this guy's better. I can still, I can win, but he could also beat me. And I thought that was a major shift in our, in our training 
was when like I didn't have too much respect for him, but I had like enough like appropriate fear. You hear a lot of people like talk about that. Like that's a real thing. You can you can by the way in this room right now, Hank, our producer, is a diehard Celtics fan. He's smiling ear to ear because you can <laughs> feel you can feel it shifting in the room that PFT and I are becoming huge Joe Missoula guys. Ten yeah. minutes into this interview, like he can he's he's looking Hank's smiling. Like, being I told like, you. Yeah, I told you this is my guy. All right, so so uh, there's very few of those around. So yeah. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, PFT, do you want to ask a question about? the town or do you want me to well I, I i had i had a question for i was just going to ask you how much a dollar bill weighs Ooh, i mean that's great huh i gotta think about that scene right so they're in the bar yeah okay it's yeah not even worth its own weight, it's not even worth its own weight. <laughs> do you have it playing yeah. behind you right now on a big tv <laughs> so let, let's clarify that mm -hmm. okay um so as an assistant i watched it two three times a week easy uh, that's too many. Would, that's too many. Just so you know. Well, well you got to think. Like we do most of our work after the games, and so like you got to stay up late at night. Like I, I never liked waking up with um, work to do from the day before. Yeah. So like when I was an assistant and I would have to turn in my post game edits, I would go home and wa and like just work from like eleven to one a.m. And so I needed something to like kind of keep me up or keep me going. So there was like a three movie shuffle uh, that I would turn on in order to get me through the game. So that I could get to bed, and the town ended up being one of them. So, like, I'm not—it's not something that I'm like, you know, I obsess with to the point where I'm still watching it. But that was—that was a part of my post-game process that kind of helped me. Okay, mm -hmm. what were the other two movies? Whiplash and The Dark Knight. Oh, okay, okay. those are good. Those are good ones. Those are yeah. ones where if they're on TV, I will—I will always watch it all the way through. Yes, if you I stumble to. upon it. Yeah, but you did. So like I, I, you have to watch those three movies. Yeah, I think you're downplaying your your obsession with the town just a little bit because you did make T-shirts from the town. Well, I mean, like, there's so many great, like, lines from that. Like the one, the one where uh, he find where he finds out that uh, Dougie McRae's uh, sleeping with the, uh, with the with the bank manager. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Renick's like smart. I'm blowing the assistant manager. Am I being smart? And, like, he just, like <laughs> <laughs> he just flips out. Like, like, out, like, randomly throughout the day. Like, some of the assistants will just like throw phrases out there from the movie. Like, I mean, anytime I walk down North End, I'm like, say your prayers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love That's that. That's fantastic. And, and I would imagine the tie-in with Boston probably has a lot to do with, with your, uh, your love of that movie too, where it's just like, okay, this makes me feel like a Boston guy watching this. I went to Fenway the other day and I was literally looking at like exit strategies. If we had <laughs> You ever decided to like rob Fenway? I was like, we could probably really get away with this. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, are you? How could you not go to Fenway and think that you could you couldn't rob it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the the blueprint is right there. I was thinking about that this morning. Actually, I was just driving. I was like, fuck. I really want to rob, rob Fenway, Fenway Park. Yeah. It would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, and you can't look at an armored truck the same. No, like, no definitely like, not. Definitely like, not. <laughs> uh are you G.I. Joe in there with where he ties his pants into his bootstraps? Yeah, that guy's a Boy Scout. Yeah. <laughs> are you are you officially retired from trying to block shots? I got forced into that. Okay. So for people who don't know, there was the Suns game this year. The the Celtics were playing the Suns, and uh Jalen Brown stole the ball in the backcourt, dunked. The Suns called the timeout, but they'd already advanced the ball. And uh, I can't remember who it was who was trying to heave one from about 40 feet. And Joe Missoula got onto the court and tried to block it after the whistle. But you were were you reprimanded for that? Uh, I was slightly – a little slap on the wrist. Okay. So, I mean, I like the energy, though. Like, the guys probably liked it. I mean, that's out of war at its finest. Like, how, I don't understand – I don't understand how you could give your opponent any opportunity to feel good about themselves <laughs> on your half of the turf. Yeah. Uh, so, like – and we've been doing that for two years. Like we, they, it started last year where um, at Cleveland, Donovan Mitchell took a free throw, and one of my assistants just watched them, and I berated him. And I was like, "Bro, what are you doing? Like, you can't allow the best player on the other team to just take a shot in front of." Him. I don't think there's anything more insulting mm -hmm. than yeah. allowing your opponent to do that. I yeah. mean, and so we just put a stop to it from then on out. And so we've had about four or five, you know, really, really good closeouts by by the staff, and you know, unfortunately. <laughs> That one was on, you know, live TV and and people saw it and, uh, you know, so we can't do it anymore. But it's it's one of those little, it's a, it's a gamesmanship thing. Like, it, it, you know, the, the NBA basketball is, is competitive and, um, you know, uh, I just think you got to be able to find any little advantage that you can. And so I'm not going to let a guy, and he, he hadn't been shooting the ball well the entire game. So like, what if that one kind of gets the, gets him the rhythm that he needs 
to make one. That's yeah. True. What about if a fan takes a shot? So hypothetically, if the ball goes into the crowd, the guy in the first row gets it, and then they want to put up a shot from the sideline. If they're uh, if they're on your team, if they're hypothetically again a, a Celtics fan, would you want them to shoot it and let it go in? Absolutely. Okay, because we have we, actually a guy that's here that lived out that hypothetical situation. Hank got the ball. What game was that, Hank? How's Warriors Finals Game Three? I think. Yeah, yeah, but he didn't have the courage to put up a shot. He he did the pump fake on it instead of actually pop, taking a dude. shot. Come on, Hank. <laughs> Do you wish he had shot that? Yes. <laughs> I got Jordan Poole to, to bite though. He, he, he. <laughs> so he like jumped at the pump fake. Yeah, he was ready to he was ready to block me, but yeah, yeah maybe yeah. You gotta shoot that. You gotta shoot that. Let let it be known. So Hank is a massive fan of yours. He's a big Celtics fan, and he's agreed that, he's agreed to shave his head and his beard if the Celtics win the NBA championship this year. So there's a there's a lot at stake here. Hank, do you have any questions for Coach? Uh, yeah, I got a couple. Um, I saw J.J. Redick and LeBron were talking about how, like, every player in the league will kind of, when they're down, they'll look up their highlights. You know, they'll go on YouTube. How often do you look up 2010 West Virginia versus Kentucky uh, Sweet 16? Never. Never? What? Never. Never. Oh. That was such a lucky game. From, like – from my standpoint, and, and you know, the one thing I always try to prevent is like the older you get, the better you were. And I was, I was not good. <laughs> 17 I, I points, first start, John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins. I don't want that to ever become a thing where it's like the older he gets, man, he was such a good player. It's like, no, I wasn't. I was like the worst player on the court at all times in the Big East. Yeah. What about what, how many times did you uh, have to hit Huggy Bear's treadmill? A decent amount. Yeah. We've we've we have we have we have had Huggy on a, a bunch of times and that treadmill he doesn't yeah. sound like it was fun. Uh it depends on what your definition of fun is. My fun is not running. No, my fun is <laughs> is you know being as combative as possible in a high stress situation. So there was a few times where we would exchange words while I was on it and he wasn't and uh -huh. I let him know that he couldn't he, w he wouldn't have been able to run on that treadmill. Yeah, I think you just like depriving your brain of oxygen in any form, whether you're getting choked out or running long distances. You just like you you like getting that that runner's high going. It's better than an arm bar. Yeah, yeah true, true. You don't hey, want to get arm bar. Yeah, or leg lock. You yeah. don't want to get leg locked. Hank, you got anything else? Uh yeah. Who, you know, vibes are good. It's after practice, maybe after a win. Who's who's the guy on the team that will kind of chirp you the most, or like? Is, is the most out outgoing to try and get a rise out of the other guys on the team? Like, who's the guy that will kind of come at you a little bit to get the other guys going? Who are players that come at me? Yeah, like yeah. chirp. Like, you know, it's yeah. it's it's like after a good practice, after a win, like they're just kind of, you know, they'll, they'll chirp you, though, to, to kind of get a laugh out of the other guys. Uh, they probably do that more when I'm not around. I think that's probably like the nature of coaching is like if your team's not making fun of you, then you're not a coach. Probably like, you know, I'm sure they, they also probably spend zero time thinking of me outside of basketball, which I'd be perfectly fine with also. Uh, but after practice, you know, it's a really cool environment. Like, I've really enjoyed being around these guys. Um, you know, you, what you learn is like you can go to each guy and kind of each guy has their own thing that you can bust balls with. You know what I mean? Like, so I try to do that after every practice or shoot around is like just get a quick touch point with the guy. And like if it needs to be a serious conversation, but I don't really enjoy being serious ever. Um if if not, it's like you know, what could we bust balls about? And so I I really enjoy that. So you, so you're like Derek, like thank God you shaved your head. No, Derek's more like he loves sarcasm. So like we'll pick something and just like just stop mocking it with like severe sarcasm. I like yeah. that. I like that. Yeah, like like we lose one game and it's like oh my God, how do, how could we ever lose? And like <laughs> or like he'll he like we'll he'll have like a turnover in a game and I'll be like bro, what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Does Paul Pierce just live at the practice facility? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I enjoy having him around. He comes around a decent amount. He's yeah. been good. Yeah. yeah. We uh we did a little research on you. Maybe some some questions that you didn't think that we would ask you. Um, I, those are the ones I love the most. Okay. Uh, the first one is that your your dad and you went to a baseball field together when you were a kid, and something unusual happened. Would you care to yeah. elaborate on that? That is uh, one of the reasons why I am today, and I think it's an important thing in – society is uh the alpha male challenge it's kind of what me and my brother call it okay and, uh, yeah yeah what's... i was feeling myself that day and uh he put his money where you know he, he tried to have me put my money where my mouth is so it was a little rainy uh baseball field on the side of the road uh head out there and he closes the gate it's kind of like where the guys do batting practice 
And uh, he just said the, the winner walks out of here alive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and did you who did he win or did you win? I mean, so I remember vividly, like it was a little bit of rain. I saw some mud and I really didn't have a plan. So like my goal was to like get mud, throw it in his face and kick him in the nuts. <laughs> and like, you know, at least like try to, you know, get him a little bit. But he had mud wasn't great, catches my heel. And then it's just a pulverizing beat down, get back in the car. And he gave me like the Will, uh, the Will Farrell old school. Like if you tell anybody about this, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Alpha male so, challenge. Like, he... <laughs> I love it. So we end up going to, uh, we always ate dinner most of the time at my grandmother's house, like typical Italian family. So I'm just sitting there like in mud, like sniffing, crying, like just eating my food, like the, <laughs> the loser that I was at the time. And like, just no one's talking to me and I'm just licking my wounds. Oh, the alpha male challenge is ju it's just locking yourself in a fence and fighting your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> okay. I like that. Yeah. What about, um, but from that on in, it was like, you know, you better, if you, if you better run your mouth, like you yeah. You better be able to handle it. <laughs> yeah. What about the fact that um, you're a head coach in the NBA, uh, you know, obviously nice contract, very successful, still driving a minivan? It's at 90,000 miles. I got to get it to 100 Gs. <laughs> what, what, what's up with that? What, what kind of minivan? I mean, if, it's a 2017 Chrysler Pacifica. Okay. Oh, you're putting some miles on that thing. Damn. Oh, yeah. It's a uh, nickname, Free Willy. Okay. You know, it's kind of shaped like an orca, my favorite animal. Okay. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. At the time, it made a lot of sense. I understand why it doesn't now, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I got to finish it out. Okay, I like that. See it through. So once it gets to hundred thousand, are you getting a new minivan? Or are you are you moving up in the world? It depends. I haven't really seen something that I like. So it started because we were living in West Virginia and we were always driving like either to Ohio or to like you know beaches around the area, like in Ocean City or you know down south. And so it made a lot of sense. Our kids were a little bit young, and so I was like, and you know. My kids had a bunch of friends living uh, in the area, and so we always had like five, six people around. So it made sense living in West Virginia. Didn't see all this happening. Doesn't make as much sense living in the city of Boston being the head coach. Yeah, yeah. I I like it though. That's a commitment to the minivan going to a hundred. It's got. If, if you were to describe it from the outside, black leather interior, automatic doors, TVs in the back, you wouldn't know that it's a minivan. Town always on for your kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's you, a, you wouldn't. I, I like that. I like that a lot. It's a good car, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hank, you have any more questions for Coach? I got a tip for Coach while you think about it, Hank. I'll take that. All right. Okay, so here's the tip. So we are taping this right now on Thursday. Bulls heat on Friday. Decide who the Celtics play. If it is the Bulls, could you please let the Bulls win one game? That's just my only request. Uh, but I got – so I, I've done a little scouting for you. Uh, whether it's the Bulls or the Heat, I got one player I picked out on each team. Uh, so I'll start with the Heat. Tyler Hero, uh, here's my scouting report. Scores in transition, especially after makes, have to connect and direct to take away pull-up threes, prefers left-hand drives, likes to drive the slot. Uh, and then for Kobe White, he runs in transition, half his shots are threes, no open looks, can't let him split uh, pick and rolls. So just a little tip for you. Uh, that actually is you from – You got that from my uh... – Yeah, that's from Joe yeah. Missoula. So Joe Missoula's Quizlet, uh, where he scouted every player in the NBA, leaked online. And uh, everyone has his, his scouting report for every player. It's a little dated now. What happened there? I mean, that's such a funny story. It also shows how, how like, attention to detail because it's just a huge PDF of every single player. Yeah, so, I, I uh, one, I didn't see any of this coming. So, I, I, I just thought I was going to be, like, the behind-the-bench, you know, slapdick, you know, for most of my career. And so, I you know, th that was kind of my uh, – introductory to like people actually give a shit about me thing. And I was kind of pissed about it. But I, I mean, I, when I made my Quizlet, I was like, I didn't know how to make it private. Yeah. I, like, <laughs> I also didn't think people were going to hack into it. So yeah. uh, I always work with rookies so that I would, I would give the rookies a well detailed, like and Quizlet gives you different types of quiz that you can, you know, decide to get through information on. Um, so we would, I would, uh, the rookies and I would always take those before the game. Oh, Okay. See, that was like that was my way of learning the league because I went came from D two to the NBA and then it was my way of like building a relationship with the rookies that I worked with. Like how detailed can we be and like what are all the different ways we can retrieve the information, whether it's like and some of them some players learn differently. So some liked matching, some liked fill in the blank, some liked um you know, multiple choice. So like it gave, it helped me learn, but it also helped me learn how the rookies learn. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very cool. I mean, it, again, it's attention to detail. Have you have you had a conversation with Derek White though about him? Uh, you had on his uh, wants to throw his body into you and draw fouls. Have you talked to him about it? Yeah, that was one of the things I was really excited about when we got him. Is we'll get to the free throw line more. Yeah, it's smart. Yeah, I, it yeah. it is interesting though that any any coach can get instant access to your mind though. Yeah, when they look that up, you should have put some like Trust fake me. fake stuff. That in is there. not that's 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 just scratch the surface about what's going on up here. Yeah, it's a yeah. Quizlet. It's just a quick like, hey, let's yeah. let's look. You at don't want to know what's really going on in, in my mind. <laughs> what's really going on in your mind? <laughs> He's trying to rob Fenway Park. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) literally, how can I win every single situation or environment? Like, how can I, how can I win the environment no matter where I am at any particular time? What are the threats, the strengths, and the opportunities? And like, can you look at every single situation uh, as a life or death situation from the standpoint of like this person's a threat? This situation's like I won't walk through revolving doors, okay? Because like one of them gets stuck, then you're just a sitting duck. Yeah. That's true. I haven't I haven't thought about that, but now every time I go through a revolving door, I'm going to think about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stuck, avoid them. You're, you're screwed. So what about okay? Uh, you go to get your coffee in the morning. Stop in Dunkin' yep. Donuts, and yep. what what goes through your mind? How do you win that situation? Uh just figure out where the exits are. Mm-hmm. Um, look at the line on the way in. Study all the people. You yeah. Know, keep, don't have your back to the door. Like you in, in a restaurant, I never sit with my back to the door. Yeah. Yeah. You always got to sit to where you can have a vantage point of like everything that's going on around you. Yeah. Okay. That's fascinating. That is. And you never turn that off. No, that's an unfortunate thing for my family. <laughs> <laughs> so like you're at home, you're, you're sitting on the couch, you're watching cartoons with the kids. What's your mindset then? Uh, what can I take from this to like teach my kid a lesson? Like you can't just watch this just to watch it. Like there's gotta be something here that's gonna, that you gotta learn from it. Yeah. I I am I'm falling in love with the coach Missoula. Yeah, and then like yeah, you know yeah. like but but it, it it it's not all positive, right? Like it's not I'm not saying I'm a good person for it. There are a ton of negative ramifications to that type of mindset. Yeah, mm-hmm. Where, I, like your wife or kids come to you with like a very empathetic situation, and it's just like, yeah, you're just telling yourself that. Yeah, yeah, right. Have, you're breaking it down like it's yeah. Like yeah. it's trying to trying to bust up someone's pick and roll strategy, and you're just like, no, yeah, I. It's like, I, okay, well, you know, well, how'd you get to this point? You know, what? I'm like, what, yeah, what, it's what, like, no, Dad, what, I just what, said what, I have a, I had a bad day. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes your wife just wants you to mean? be like, yeah, that person was very unfair to you. Today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's like no, like you can't let that person be unfair to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hank, what was your? You thought of one? Uh yeah, you roll you roll a jujitsu mat on the on the floor after practice, whole team tournament. Ooh. Who's walking out there? No injuries. Injuries are impossible. Whole team tournament. Who's who's walking out on top? Man, that, so that's kind of the beauty of jujitsu is like you don't know. Everyone's a weapon. And everyone has a different weapon. And you don't know that weapon until you get into the fight. Like if you've ever gone to a jujitsu class, one of the most debilitating things to your own ego is like the three guys next to you that are like overweight, just came from like work. They can barely do like the push ups and the sit ups, like in the warm up, but they're like brown belts and you get into a fight and you, you, you last like 10 seconds. And it's like, how did I lose to this guy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like it actually teaches you to respect everybody around you, but study each guy. And like you study each guy's body type and it's like, okay, like if I get into a fight with that guy, like he seems more of like a leg dominant guy. He'll probably have some like leg triangles or, you know, that guy's a little speed athletic. So it'll, it, it, you can't take anyone for granted and you have to have the ultimate respect for everyone because everyone's a weapon in their own way. Like that's the beauty of it. So I, I don't know because you don't know what any, any one person's capable of. Yeah. I, I bet it's Brad Stevens. Yeah. I bet Brad has a plan too, to kill everybody in the room. Yeah. He seems like the kind of guy that would have that. Speak, yeah. Speaking of Brad, has he ever told you you're coaching for your job? Um, doesn't everybody tell me that? Well, yeah. I mean, your job is to coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah, I kind of yeah. tell myself, I kind of tell myself that. No, yeah. we, we have an, I, we have an old friend, internet friend who would always tweet Brad Stevens coaching for his job and people would get so upset and he's like, well, his job is to coach. <laughs> I, I tell myself that though. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a good mentality to have. How much do you yeah. guys miss having Blake Griffin on the team? this? Oh year? Yeah. Man, he's awesome, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he best. was on the show on Wednesday. He just he was he's one of our good friends. I when I told this story yesterday. Like I have the utmost respect for him. So when he, when I get the job and we sign Blake Griffin, and I'm like, shit, like this guy was a number one pick. Like I don't know anything about this guy. I knew everyone else on the team for the most part, and I'm like, 
how am I going to coach this guy? You know, like it, sometimes the hardest people to coach are like the guys that are a little bit aging, like they may still have it. They may not, you know what I mean? And um, so I make a, we make a decision to kind of be like, we go away from him for a couple games or whatever the case may be. And uh, he comes up to me and he's like, what do I have to do to get better? And I was like, damn, like that said everything I need to know about the type of person that he is like to, of his stature and like experience mm-hmm. to have the respect for a first time head coach who, you know, didn't know what the hell he was doing to ask that question and to like take it serious to where he was out there every single day. Like I have the utmost respect for him. Did you, did you tell him learn how to dunk again? <laughs> I told him we need to get a car out there so we could jump over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blake is the best. And he has, he had nothing but high praise for you guys. And, and he said that he was like very close to wanting to come back, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to cheapen it and like come back at the end of the year and, and not be with the guys all year, which I respect the hell out of. I refrained from begging him to come back because he, he told me he wanted to be with his kids. And so like, you know, I know how hard that could be, but I would have done a lot to get him back in our locker room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, on that note, we always said would say that like uh, Blake's the most important player on any team that he's on, regardless of how much he was playing, just because he's he's a good guy to have around. He's kind of like the, the straw that stirs the drink sometimes. Um, yeah. Outside of like the superstars on the Celtics right now. Yeah. Uh, who would you say would be the most important guy? I would tell you like that range from like, like eight and a half to uh, like 14. Like those guys don't get enough credit because they, they really hold the locker room together because they could easily shut it down halfway through the year or have like a negative mentality. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so like, like, you know, like, like Peyton and Sam, they, they have their minutes and um, they've gone through that grind of like the inconsistencies and they've played their butts off this year and like have been great. Um, but like the O'Shea, the Luke, the Tillman, uh, the Sfee, I don't want to forget anybody here, so help me with that. But like those group of guys that like don't get it every single day and then you have a guy that gets an injury and now they're starting or like it's a second night of a back-to-back and one of them's playing 20 minutes and like you're being hard on them because, you know, you need them to help you win. Like that, those group of guys, really grateful because – like you said, I don't think they get enough credit for how they help the culture of the locker room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Co- Ringer. Yeah. Well, Coach, this has been awesome. We really appreciate it. I got one last question for you. It's Roback, uh, Roback question, com. Promo code take, uh, Q-zips, polos, hoodies, joggers, shorts, even bathing suits now. Roback.com, promo code take. So we did have an inside source for this interview, your brother. He brought uh-huh. up um, something about an Italian bakery. There's two of them maybe in your your hometown and and there's a big debate about it so can we settle the debate can you tell us the debate and settle it i mean the debate i guess is which one's better yeah so which one yeah. is i mean i can't i don't want to do that to either company okay i, I do want to talk about the uh, italian discrimination to the big east conference that yes. you guys have. okay yes. all right speak on it yes yeah i couldn't i can't I, I when i heard that i was like yes like you gotta think <laughs> Like Massimino, Carnesecca, Gavit, like yeah, of course there's an Italian discrimination to the league. <laughs> yeah, you think that's why they didn't get enough uh, enough bids in the tournament this year? Yeah, everyone's just tired of the the, the tallies. <laughs> <laughs> Max is pumping his that fist rock, right that now. rock. This is bullshit <laughs> because I was that Sixers fan. I'm not sense. supposed to like you, but that rock, yeah. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, you've even won over the Sixers fan here. It's hard to do. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't. I, when you said that, I was like, there had like. There's been so much mafia run through the Big East over the years. <laughs> yeah. people, are probably, people are probably tired of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so who's on your Mount Rushmore of Italians? Oh, good question. That's a great question. Thank you. Great question. Putting you um, on the spot here, yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, I mean, Mario Balotelli's got to be up there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. He'll play for the national team. Uh, their goalie also. Uh, he's been around really. Buffon? Buffon, yeah. yeah. He's played yeah. for like 30 time. years. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of like naturalized citizens that have been, you know, up there along the way. Yeah. You can go with, you can go old school, like a little Leonardo, uh, you know, Da Vinci. You can go with some, some of that stuff. Yeah. Donatello, all the Ninja Turtles. All the Ninja Turtles. I, I, think, all the, I, I, I think I appreciate Donatello and Leonardo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah it, should, um, yeah. it should just be the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. It should be the Ninja, and Mike Florio, who's an Italian from West Virginia. So you got to mention him, Mike Florio. Yeah. But I think I think the Ninja Turtles are probably up there. Yeah, yeah, all four of them. Oh, <laughs> the yeah. best Italians. You should, have, you should have your jujitsu guy come over dressed as as Michelangelo and choke you out. <laughs> that would rock. Or, or use one of the uh, who's the guy who's the one with the nunchucks? 
Nunchucks is Michelangelo. Like Michelangelo, party, party dude. dude. Yeah, yeah, Calabonga. Yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. Okay. Yeah, he's the best. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Best. I I would take you as more of a Raphael guy, but that's that's more calculating. But Michelangelo, Raphael's more my personality. Yeah, yeah. Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Is yeah. my son's favorite, so I, I I flock to him. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's good to have yeah. it's good to have Italian represent representation in media like the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no question. Um, well, and, coach and bakeries. Yeah, and yeah. bakeries. Coach, this has been awesome. We are you you've won us over. Um, good luck in the, in the rest of the uh, in the playoffs. If it's the Bulls, I hope that you can at least give us one game. If it's the Bulls, you got to come by the office and maybe put us through a drill. Maybe choke us out. Yeah. Oh, oh no no not. If it's Chicago, we go through a jujitsu session at the facility. Done. Okay. Guys, done. So, I'm in. Done. And we work on like contingency plans, exit strategies. Yes. To show uh huh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Always a way out. Yes. I feel like you would hate going to an escape room. Ooh. No, I, we went to one this year. And were, how, were you panicked in there? Were you like, I don't know how to oh, get I out? I love that. I think I, I, I wanted to make a room in my house an escape room. <laughs> <laughs> because like you get so, so, so we move into so we I get the job right and we buy a house. And, uh, you know, my wife's like super excited. Like it's one of the goals of her life, like to have the a house like, a, and she picked a really nice one. And, uh, so what we have, a, we have jujitsu mats at the house. So Alex comes over and he's like, you know, this might not be a good thing. Like, you know, the guy that lives in the town home, isn't the guy that lives in this nice house. You know, the guy that, uh, drives a car to, to work is not the same guy that used to walk to work. Like you can't let this. You can't let this change you. So like all, so then like the classes for that week were like all demoralizing to make sure that I didn't like enjoy the fact that we moved into this house. So I'm sitting in bed with my wife and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's a nice house, but we, we just can't let this get the best of us. Like we got a big, we got, we got, you know, stuff coming up. We got to stay locked in. Like we can't let this change us. And she like almost started crying. <laughs> <laughs> like it's my dream. You are, yes. and she's like, you are an idiot. <laughs> You develop a rivalry against the house every day. You're trying to beat the house. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Alpha like, male challenge like, with the house. Walk into the house and like kick the door on purpose. Or there's a whole like, this house is shitty. Yeah. All right, Respect well, that. coach, this has been so so much fun. Um, and yeah, you have won us all over. And and best of luck in the playoffs. And uh, we'll talk soon. I appreciate it. Hey, and last thing I want you guys to know, uh, I came into coaching. Uh, because I think NBA players get get a bad rep, and there's a you always hear about college coaches or people say they can't coach. Uh, I got the best group of guys. Um, I think NBA players in general are misunderstood with what they deal with on and off the floor, like what they put their bodies through, and like just because they make a lot of money doesn't mean that it's easy. And so I got the best job in the world coaching the Celtics, and I got the best job in the world because. Uh, I got great players and they allow me to be myself and allow me to coach them. And, uh, you know, I can't take that for granted. So I want you guys to know that. And uh, I'll come on anytime and bust balls with you. Okay. okay. And Love just it. so you know what you just said, that doesn't mean we can't say like, oh, I would have made that free throw. Because I will say no, that from no. my couch. Okay. All Absolutely. Right. You okay. have to say that. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 Later. All right. Thanks, Thanks coach. coach. Joe Mazzullo is brought to you by our great friends over at Proper Number 12. Irish whiskey. I love Proper 12. I had some Proper 12 last weekend. And I want to remind you guys to pour the roar with Proper Number 12 Irish whiskey. And they also have Proper Irish Apple. It's from the heart of Dublin 12. Original Proper Number 12 is rich. It's smooth. It's a blend of golden grain and single malt aged four years in bourbon barrels. Truth be told, I can't think of anything better than a pregame session of Proper Whiskey and Gingers. Or my personal springtime pick, which is Proper Irish Apple. A delicious blend of Proper's award-winning Irish whiskey with crisp and fresh notes of Irish apple. Proper number 12 Irish whiskey, Proper 12 Irish apple. Two refreshing ways to pour the roar because anything else just wouldn't be proper. You can pick up a bottle, try it for yourself. Original, rich and smooth Proper 12 Irish whiskey. Or you can try crisp and fresh Irish apple. It's all smooth to the core. And now, here is Denver Nuggets coach Michael Malone. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. It is Coach Michael Malone, Denver Nuggets, uh, NBA champs. We haven't seen you since you won the NBA championship, so uh, let us be the last people to wish you congratulations on uh, winning the NBA title. We had you on last year around this time, uh, and I want to. I want. We want to talk about playoffs, the season, everything. But the first question, very important question, how are we doing with the Mike versus Michael thing? Are people following the rules? Are they actually following the rules? 
you know, I think uh, I think I scared most people away when I uh, when I was very rude to a uh, Cassidy Hubbard on the sidelines of a play uh, of a playoff game. But no, most people are following the rules. I think the the streets are talking. They know that if they don't call me Michael, my mother's going to come looking for him. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. You got you got to put your flag in the ground. Let people know. Yeah, we were actually the Michael Police last year. When yeah. we saw people referring to using the the wrong word. We would jump down their throat and say, no, you get it right. That's a future NBA championship coach right there and put some respect on his name. Um, I appreciate it. But, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, we, we were rooting for you last year. Obviously, we, we believed in the Nuggets uh, from, I, I think, like two years ago. We started to say, get ready for the Nuggets because they're coming. They're a great team. Uh, so thank you for making us look like we know ball. It's a very rare occurrence where we look smart on the show. So we want to make sure to give you your credit for that. And uh, I just want to say that I, I'm looking forward to another – potential Michael Malone uh, championship parade yeah. because you had you had the best time ever at that parade. And I think everybody watching was like, yeah, if I ever won a championship, that's exactly what I would do. So how long <laughs> how long did it take you to feel normal after the parade? Oh, I tell you a while. And uh, the worst part about that parade was that night we went to Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, I started early that day, so I didn't last late into the night, unfortunately. But uh, the parade was awesome. My wife was next to me on the fire truck. She kept on telling me to slow down, slow down. And uh, I really didn't know what that meant. We just won a championship, and I definitely went all out. And uh, hopefully we can find a way to uh, celebrate another parade because this city turned out, and that was one of the coolest moments of my life was not only winning a championship, but celebrating with a city that had waited for 47 years to win their first NBA championship. Yeah. Even Jokic had fun at the parade. That's how you know that it was a good parade. So, mm -hmm. all right. So last question about last year, and then let's turn the page all focus on this year. Uh, how many times have you looked down on your arm and been like, I really did get that tattoo. <laughs> Sometimes I forget I have it. And then obviously I get out of the shower. I look in the mirror and I, I remind myself I got Maxie the minor holding the trophy, <laughs> and he's, he's going to be with me every step of the way moving forward. Yeah. And I, I did save some room, though, for some more trophies and more tattoos. So we'll see what happens. I yeah. like that. So you, you said almost immediately after you won, you might have even said it before you won your first title, that, that the goal was to establish something long term, to establish a dynasty in Denver. When did you start thinking that it would be possible to even compete for multiple championships? You know, I go back to the bubble, and uh, I know we lost to the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals, uh, but that's when I felt, you know what? We have a special player in Nikola Jokic. We have a special player in Jamal Murray, and now we have to make sure we bring the right pieces in to help those guys. And we had injuries after the bubble where we weren't whole in the playoffs, but finally being whole and healthy and adding guys like Aaron Gordon, adding guys like obviously Contavious Caldwell-Pope, we have Michael Porter, who's just continued to get better and better. And last year, having veterans like Jeff uh, Green and Bruce Brown and a young player in Christian Brown who showed out and helped us win a play a finals game on the road in mm -hmm. Miami. And it was uh, we knew if we were healthy, we had a chance to beat anybody. Yeah. And last year was the first time in a while where we were completely healthy and uh, it, all, it all came together at the right time. So talking about this year, uh, you've been coaching for a very long time. This was the first time that you're coaching and you have a championship team that just won a title. What were the challenges like uh, day in and day out coaching a team, knowing like, you know, we talk about it all the time with sports. There's a, a switch that you can flip. Was there moments where you're like you could feel that maybe the focus wasn't there because everyone's been there, done that, and they're just waiting for the playoffs? Was it a different set of challenges as a coach to get that motivation day in and day out because you already hit the top of the mountain and you got to climb back up? Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, and, and that was our whole mindset going into this year, starting a training camp in San Diego. And, you know, I, I told our players, listen, we've gone from being one of the 29 teams – that's hunting a championship. And now we're going to be the team that's being hunted by everybody else. And with that success comes responsibility to understand that and to own that. And now that means you have to work harder every day. You have to be more prepared and understand 82 games this year, you're getting everybody's best. Yeah. And I tell you what, we tied a franchise record for 57 wins this year. We went 21 and six out of the all-star break tied for the best record in the NBA uh, I give our players a ton of credit for handling that responsibility in a very mature manner. Were there times this year where I felt like I had to jumpstart the guys and remind them of that? Of course, 82 games is a long season, but 
uh, here we are, no, number two seed, getting ready for the first round. And uh, again, I think our players have done an outstanding job of handling that success while also not being satisfied and staying hungry because we want more. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned responsibility. Do you feel a sense of responsibility knowing that you have uh, maybe, you know, uh, certainly a, a transcendent player in Jokic, a guy whose skill set we've never seen before in the NFL, or excuse me, the NBA, and a guy who moving forward could be an all time great? Do you feel responsible that you have to make sure that he's able to tap into all this enormous potential and tap into his ability to like the highest extent? Is that something that you think about? Like, I don't want to let this guy down. Of course. And, and for Nicola, but for all the other players too. You know, we won a championship last year, and I think we did something that I don't think any other championship team has done. We went younger in hopes of trying to repeat. So now developing Christian Brown, Peyton Watson, Julian Strother, while having our, our five-man uh, starting lineup, who we know what we're going to get from them every single night. But I always feel a responsibility to not only help Nicola, but to prepare our team to put them in the best position to have success. And if we don't win a game – the first person I look at is me. What could I have done better? What could I have done differently to help my team? And, uh, you know, we, we we always bounce back. We always stay together. A very connected group. And that's why I love coming to work every day because I feel our locker room of players, my coaching staff, our front office, our ownership group, I think we have something special that I don't think you find in all of pro sports very often. Yeah, all right. So bad memory question, but I, I'm very interested in your uh, response. So you guys were fighting for the one seed. Friday night you lose to the Spurs. Uh, get the two seed. Still an incredible season. Like you said, franchise uh, record in wins. But what Wemby did on Friday night, can you tell us standing there uh, and watching him like – has, there's never been anything like that in the NBA in terms of just his ability. Like, he's so much bigger than everyone. He's shooting threes. W did you ever catch yourself while playing him at any point this year being like, what am I even watching right now? This is insane. Oh, uh, definitely. And obviously, you know, we played them four times. And what was really impressive about watching Wemby this year from early in the year to we played him in game 81 is the improvement within one season. And early in the year, you could tell, wow, this guy is really tall. Uh, he can block shots. He's pretty skilled. By the end of the season, and I think Pop did a great job, and that's why he's a great coach, you saw Wemby handling the ball in the open court. You saw him shooting pull-up threes. But the one thing that really jumped off the page for me that I saw a huge improvement was Wemby's ability to be a playmaker, his passing ability. He was making all of his teammates better. And for me, that's always a mark of greatness. How, yeah, you can be a really good player, but can you make those around you better? And obviously it was a tough loss for us. Uh, but yes, you're watching Wemby and you're saying, wow, this guy is the future of the NBA. He impacts the game offensively, defensively, playmaking, and he's a competitor. I mean, he's only going to get better. He's going to get stronger. But uh, I, I don't see any weaknesses in his game. Yeah, I mean, it was the game that he scored, I think, 17 points in three minutes. And it was just crazy. like, what is going on right now? It's it's it's, it's yeah, crazy to watch. Threes, I mean, he was shooting pull-up threes from 35 feet. You know, you're not used to seeing that from a player at 7'4", whatever he is. Uh, you see that from Steph Curry. But now you have a 7-footer doing all those things, and it's kind of like, wow, this guy is going to be unguardable at some point. Yeah, yeah, with the longest arms ever. So it's almost like he's got the arms of a seven foot six guy, and he's seven foot four. It's like impossible to stop something like that. How do you how do you go about game planning for a great individual player like that? Because we saw it just a, a couple of weeks ago in uh, in March Madness in the NCAA tournament, where uh, Hurley's strategy against Edie was basically, you know, he's going to get his points. And we can let him get his points, but we're not going to let everybody else on the court beat us. When you're going up against a superstar player, and obviously in the NBA, everybody's good, right? Everyone can shoot the ball. But is that is that more often than not your strategy of just accept the fact that the superstar is going to do some damage and try to limit everybody else? Well, I think it depends on the player, the matchup, who's around that player. There are definitely games and opponents will all say, listen, we know he's going to get his, but they're at their best when everybody else gets going. So you let that certain player maybe get his 25 to 30 points, but you take away the three-point line to, for their other players. Then there are certain nights where you say, listen, we can't let this guy get off. He's scoring way too easy. We have to send a double team. And that's not just in the post. That may be a player on the perimeter uh, like an Anthony Edwards, like a, a Jalen Brown, 
who are just really tough covers on the perimeter where you may have to send a secondary defender and then look to fly around behind that. And obviously, you know, Danny Hurley, a tremendous job at UConn winning another title and his game plan against Zach Eady in the post was terrific. They took away all the Purdue uh, shooting and made Eady be the one guy that was scoring. And then there were times where they decided to double team, but their multiple effort and fly around mentality was outstanding. That was what impressed me about UConn was just their defense on the ball, off the ball for, for, for 40 minutes was just incredible. So I had a question about that. So it, it's, uh, you know, New Jersey high school players are having a moment right now with Danny Hurley winning his back to back. You're you, you know, you went to uh, Seton Hall prep for a couple of years in New Jersey trying to go back to back. Did you play against uh, it would be Bobby, right? Like he was at yeah, the Bobby. time. Did you have games against him? Oh, yeah. No, I played against Bobby and, uh, you know, the other St. Anthony's players, uh, Jerry Walker, all the guys, uh, uh, Jasper Walker, different players. But, yeah, Danny was younger, but Dan uh, Bobby was more my age. And obviously Bobby was an incredible player at St. Anthony's, at Duke. And unfortunately his career in the NBA was uh, was was cut short. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that era of, you know, that, that tri-state New York City, New Jersey basketball was was incredible. Yeah, Talentine High School who had, you know, Malik Seeley, Brian Reese, Adrian Autry. Uh, you had Kenny Anderson at Malloy. Uh, there, there were a lot of great players in that area at that time. And uh, I always look forward to playing against a guy like Bobby because he was considered one of the best point guards in the country. Yeah, yeah. tough, tough New Jersey high school uh, players into coaches are having a, a big moment right now. The other the other one I had for you was uh, your start in coaching. Uh, Greg Campy, who just won his first yeah. NCAA uh, tournament game with our guy Jack Golke. Did you talk to him after at all? Because that was that was a very cool moment. And for people who don't know, you, you basically got your start – uh, like doing anything for him way back yeah. in the day at Oakland University. He's been there for 40 years, and he finally yeah. gets that one big moment beating Kentucky. Well, you know what the great thing is? So I got that job at Oakland because my father was an assistant coach in Detroit with Chuck Daly, and they used to practice at Oakland University. So my father had a relationship with Campy, and when I was getting out of college, I wanted to get into coaching, and my father put in a good word with Greg Campy, who hired me. Now, Oakland was Division II at the time, but I was a volunteer assistant coach, and uh, the coolest part about that job was Barry Sanders used to come over and play open gym, and here he is, the greatest, arguably the greatest running back in NFL history who loved hoops, and having a chance to play with him was, uh, was a memory I'll never forget. But Coach Campy and I have stayed in touch. My father passed away this past October, Coach Campy was one of the first guys to reach out to me. And when they beat Kentucky that night, uh, I, I hit him up right away. I'm sure I was one of a thousand messages. But for him to be there for 40 years and him to have that kind of a win behind the unbelievable shooting of Jack Golke uh, was incredible. And I was so happy for Coach Campy. The, the Oakland program and obviously Coach Camby's entire family. Yeah, wait, wait, we got to, you just glossed over something. Barry Sanders playing pickup basketball. What was his game like? Well, I tell you what, I couldn't get over the size of his legs and the size of his neck. Yeah. He was an incredible athlete. Uh, and it's funny, man, he was just, he was, for the, the player he was and all the success he had and all the records that he had, very, very humble, very quiet, but loved basketball, wanted to come in. Uh, my sister Kelly actually worked for the Lions that time. At that time, so I got to know him a little bit. Uh, unbelievable person, just uh, humble, selfless, loved to hoop. And you wouldn't need, if you didn't know who he was, you think he was just a regular guy in there playing hoops. Uh, and that's what I loved about him. Yes, he was a great running back uh, who carried those Lions teams for years. But uh, I was just impressed with how he carried himself as a man. What was his comp though? Player comp. Player comp? Oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Nate Robinson. Okay. You know? okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah that's good. a very good one. Did he travel really, the ball a lot? Really, he just stopped dribbling. Really <laughs> strong, explosive. Um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. Nate Robinson popped into my head. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it would be it'd be amazing just to go try to guard Barry Sanders in any sport. It would be incredible. Do, do, do you know uh, Jack? Made sure he was on my team. Yeah, yeah. smart. That's a yeah. smart move. You should bring Golki in for a tryout. Yeah. He needs a look. The, the kid can shoot. Well, I tell you what, Yubi Brown, who I got to know, my father was on his staff back in the day, one of the greatest coaches in the history of the a game of basketball. And Hubie Brown had a saying, shooting makes up for a multitude of sins. 
If you can shoot the ball in today's game, there's a place for you. And what Jack Golke did on the biggest stage in the country was really, really impressive. And I, I think there are a lot of Jack Golke fans. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Coach Campy even talked about it. That night after they won that game, people from Louisville were buying Oakland gear. Yeah. Because they wanted to wear it in <laughs> Kentucky and rub it in the, the Kentucky fans' faces. Yeah, yeah. so let's give them a trial because we're, we, we're big Jack Golke fans. We actually had him in our office, and we have a full-court basketball court, so we, we, we he got to do a workout. <laughs> we got to do some drills with him. He can shoot. We'll, we'll tell you right now. We'll be your advanced scouts. As I don't know. If, I don't know if you knew this. Guy can shoot. <laughs> mm -hmm. can fill it well, up. Here's my question: at, at a big cat PFT, who is the better shooter? Who's got the Who's got the 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 the, the shot? That would be big cat. Yeah, I'm more of a uh, facilitator. Yeah, <laughs> you you should listen next next season when you're in Chicago. Uh, you should come by because we we do run okay. fives on Friday, and it's probably the worst basketball you could ever watch. It's like those when when you run uh, pick up basketball, and maybe the first game. It's like uh, 15 minutes, and then the second game, everyone gets tired, and it's like 35 <laughs> minutes to get to 11, mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah. this is just atrocious to watch. Well, I look forward. I will stop by. <laughs> if the schedule permits, I'd love to stop by and see you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah coach us up. Um, I, I actually have a pointer for you. I know that you know, you've accomplished a lot as a coach. You can always get better, though, right? We're always no looking doubt. to improve around the margins. You're great at uh, at getting in the ref's face, at, at giving them a piece of your mind when you feel like your player has been fouled, they don't call it. I saw it a couple times at Aaron Gordon this year. You're not afraid to let the ref have it. But there's one player that you don't do it enough for, and that's Jokic when he's trying his like three-quarter length three-pointer when he's yes. getting fouled, and, and they never call the foul on him. And it's a foul. They get him on the arm. I know that the refs are like, oh, this is weird. Why is he shooting it from the opposing foul line? I think you need to get in the ref's face when they don't call that and let them know that's a foul. Well, I tell you what. So to clarify, they are calling the foul. But what they're not giving them is the free throws. They're saying it's right. a non-shooting foul. And, and I, I, the funny thing is I've had a lot of conversations with the refs as well as the league about it because I don't think people understand how smart Nicola is. He sees, th he sees it before it happens. And so he knows the player is about to come up and he'll stop around 70 feet from the basket, raise up and let it go. And I asked the ref one time, I said, be honest, the reason you're not giving him free throws is because of where it happened. Because, you know, well, what right minded player is going to shoot a shot 70 feet away? And I go, but you shouldn't be worried about the location. It's more about is he in his upward shooting motion? And uh, it's an ongoing debate. And hopefully at one point we'll be able to get that. But hey, if I have to get thrown out one time, I, I obviously I, I have no problem doing that. I, yeah. With the day that he gets that call is going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. He's been trying for it for so long. It also might ruin the NBA forever the second <laughs> that he gets that call because then everyone's going to be doing that. But yeah. I, I want to see it happen the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to see it as well. I think uh, he deserves it. He's probably around 0 for 12 in those attempts, and hopefully we'll get it one day. Yeah. So uh, speaking of Jokic, um, is there ever a time where you're like, hey, uh, can you shoot more? Because he's so good at sometimes, you know, like a game will start and he's just facilitating to everyone and he's maybe passing up shots to get everyone else involved. Do you ever have to say, like, listen, thank you for passing to everyone, but I need you to shoot because every time you shoot, it's, you, it goes in? <laughs> yeah, well, he's one of the more efficient players that we've ever seen, and that's why obviously he's a two-time MVP and potentially a three-time MVP. Uh, but, you know – there are times where I have to say, listen, you need to be a little bit more aggressive. You know, certain teams choose to double team him from the get go. Other teams choose to play him straight up. It's pick your poison with him, like we touched on earlier. Um, but there are there are games where he's such a great passer. He's always reading the defense and he wants to get other people involved. That's why he's great, because he's going to be one of the top three assists per game players in the league every year. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's like joke. You gotta, you gotta be more aggressive. Look to attack before the double team, or when you have one-on-one -on -one coverage, go to work. He's proven to be unguardable, and that's not a knock on anybody. That's just speak to his greatness and his ability to find and solve any riddle thrown at him. And we've mm -hmm. seen him do it time and time again, and none better than last year during our run to the to the finals and ultimately winning our championship. But um, he is a great player. He's a great passer. He's really unselfish. So usually I trust him 1,000% to read the game and play the game the way he sees. But there will be an occasional time where, yeah, hey, hey listen, like 
go to work you know, look look to score and uh and he we know he can do that yeah and i think he's in really great shape too i think that's a very underrated part of his game is his conditioning people look at him sometimes and he might not have like the muscle definition on on the biceps that some other guys have uh but i i feel like people don't give him credit do you think he's you think teams underestimate how in shape he is uh, i i couldn't agree with that more and i think the perfect example was you go back uh, I think six years ago, our first time making the playoffs, we had a game in Portland that went four overtimes. I think Nicola played 60 minutes. And uh, and I don't know how many players can do that and and play effectively and efficiently. Uh, but Nicola, you know, I think people always judge athleticism on how high you can jump. Well, if that's the only way you're going to judge his athleticism, what are you going to say Nicola's not a great athlete? But it's more than just jumping. It's hand-eye coordination. It's it's um, the ability to have unbelievable stamina. He loves horses, and I say you like Secretariat, man. He's got like a, a huge heart. Nicola can run for days, and uh, you look at how much we play him, and now that the playoffs are about to start, how much more we're about to play him because we know that when he's on the floor, good things tend to happen for us. I think yeah. it goes back to that, that picture that always goes around of him as a kid. And so people yeah. see that picture and they're like, oh, this guy can't run. But no, he's he's always out there and he's always running. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think it works to your advantage, though, that they that sometimes teams don't really recognize how great of shape he's in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think the other thing that like you talk about the athleticism, I think the other really common uh, misperception about Nikola Jokic is, oh, well, because he's not a good athlete, he's not a good defender. And that, I, I don't think that could be further from the truth. I think Nicole is actually a very good defender. And you don't have to be a good defender to be a guy that's jumping and blocking shots above the rim. He has unbelievable hand-eye coordination. He's one of the top guys in the NBA in terms of deflections. You guys have seen him break, in, break up a lot of passes with his feet um, and his timing, anticipation. Uh, he's one of the few players in the NBA that's got over 100 steals and close to 70 blocks. Yeah. So uh, I think that's also – an area that people try to pick him apart, but he's proven people wrong time mm -hmm. and time again. So one thing you're a lead at, and I, I've read a bunch of stories, and it's very clear when you talk about your team is your ability to connect with each guy person to person and, like, the stories of you going to visit Jokic at his home. Did you ride a horse, by the way, when you went there? I, so I didn't ride the horse, but Nicola let me ride the carriage. Okay, all right, that was, counts. Was, he, he took me to practice one day, and – he goes, coach, come on. And he told me what to do. And I went around and he was really mad at me because he said it was a practice and I was supposed to go a lot slower. And I was like, Ben Hur, man. I was like, let's go. And uh, but yeah, so I did that one time and he'll probably never let me do that again. That's fantastic. So your ability to connect with guys, you know, one on one, you know, when you you had that quote about Jamal Murray's injuries and how he's going to be back. I think, you know, when it comes to coaching, the best coaches are able to get their teams to trust them on such a level that it's like, you know what I'm doing is going to get you to a place where you can win a championship. Was there a moment in these last few years where you could feel like my team is finally in? Like they're finally all have bought into what I'm selling and they all are going to trust me no matter what I say. They might not agree all the time, but they trust that what I'm doing is trying to put them in the best spot. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Good and question. I, Thank you. I, I, I go back to, um, you know, the bubble. Um, but even our first time making the playoffs, you know, we, we played San Antonio in the first round. And here we are playing the Spurs, right, and Coach Popovich. And we, we won in seven games. And that was brand new for Jamal. That was brand new for me. That was brand new for Nicola. And I think that's really helped that Nicola and I have been together for nine years. Jamal and I have been together for eight. And then we've added pieces around. I think Aaron Gordon's been here for four and a half now. Michael Porter for five. So what you have with that continuity creates chemistry and trust. So I've never felt like I had to, like, win them over. I felt like we've always been connected. And we and and for me, it's it's never been this is what we're doing and it's my way or the highway. What I learned from a guy like Coach Popovich is when we talk about trust as part of our culture, I got to trust our players. So last year during our run to the finals, we're going through games and scouting reports and opposing plays. I'm giving our players input. What do you guys see? What do you want to do in this play? Yeah. So now I'm empowering them so we all feel a part of it. Um, and so I'm not a dictator. I'm very much a coach that wants to give our players input and uh, and not so I hope it fails, but – Hey, 
you're out there playing. And uh, I, I think through all those conversations and all the time that we've been together, um, I, I think that's allowed us to get to a place where we trust each other. It's not just them trusting me. I also trust our players, and uh, we have great dialogue within that. So off that question, you, you mentioned Aaron Gordon, who has been phenomenal for you guys. And w what is it, though, putting a guy like Aaron Gordon, who is with the Magic, he's the best guy in the Magic, then he comes to the Nuggets, and his role is going to be a little different, and he's not the best guy anymore, but you need him to play winning basketball. How does that process work when you have a, a new guy on the team and you're like, look, you were the man, you're still the man, but there's other guys here who are going to be the man and you're going to play off them a little bit more? Well, I, I think Aaron Gordon deserves the credit here. I mean, I, I could sit here and say, hey, we had conversations about this and that, which we did. But ultimately, uh, it's up to the man. It's up to the person, the player, to understand I'm coming to a team that's really good. They've won. They haven't won at the highest level yet, but I can help them get over the hump. And the funny thing is, right when we got Aaron Gordon after that trade deadline, we beat the Clippers in, uh, in L.A. when they were fully loaded and healthy. And that's when I think we all realize that we got a chance if we stay healthy to win and win big and win a championship. Unfortunately, injuries happened that year, the year after, but then we finally had that chance last season. But uh, Aaron came in understanding that, listen, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help this team. I'm playing next to a great player who's one of the most unselfish players, highest IQs and great passers. I'm just going to play off of him. I'm going to play off of Jamal Murray. I'm going to defend. I'm going to rebound. And I'm going to be completely selfless in everything I do. And I think guys like Aaron Gordon, guys like KCP, embody being truly selfless every single day. Because when people talk about the Nuggets, it's Nicole Jokic. It's Jamal Murray. And Michael Porter, Aaron Gordon, KCP don't get as much of, of the attention, but they're all just as important in our success. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's awesome watching a team come together like that where you have pieces from all over the place and it's everyone kind of steps into their role. It's it's beautiful to watch when basketball works that way. Yeah, and, and Christian Brown, too. You mentioned him earlier. Like, as a, a spark X factor, is he? What, what would he have to do to get into, like, the starting rotation? Because I know he's great – in certain aspects of his game. I think, I think I've heard you talk about him in transition before and how that is a, a key factor in his game. Is that a guy that you see ever becoming a rotation guy? Well, I mean, he's a rotation guy for us now. And when we've had injuries, he started a bunch of games for us this year. Uh, his versatility is what you love about him. He can be a small forward, a two guard. And he's actually been, when Jamal was out for a while this year, Christian has been our backup point guard at times. So um, there's not a position he can't play. And you talk about transition. Uh, I felt probably maybe halfway through this season, Christian wasn't playing the way I was hoping he would have played this year. Uh, he didn't have the same aggression, didn't have the same defensive disposition that I thought he needed to have. And uh, I called him in. We met. We watched film from last year of how he helped us win, even clips from him in the NBA Finals. And I said, this is what we need from you. You know, for you to be the best player for this team, we need you to be more aggressive. We need you to be tougher. We need you to be more disciplined and uh, and to lock down on defense. And to his credit, from that meeting through the end of the season, I thought he was tremendous for us. He's put a lot of time into his game. He's shooting the three ball really well. He is a hell of a finisher. If you go back to that Minnesota game, some of the dunks he had in transition were just incredible. Yeah. Highlight dunks with his left hand on a guy like Rudy Gobert. Uh, but he's an important piece because he can fill so many holes. And for me with Christian, CB is what we call him. It's always about his intangibles, man. He's got an edge to him. He's won at every level. I want him to go out there and just be a dog and get after people, hit people, be aggressive. And uh, when he does that, he's a difference maker. And the other young guy that I, I think has really improved this year is Peyton Watson. You know, Peyton Watson is doing things defensively, blocking shots, uh, at the rim, a lot of plays defensively that most guys in the league can't make. So Peyton didn't play at all last year. He's in the rotation this year, and uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for him these coming playoffs to really step up because we all know the playoffs is a lot different than the 82-game mm -hmm. regular season. Yeah, yeah you guys yeah. got a lot of weapons. Yeah. Uh, Coach, we, we asked this question to everybody. It's a fun little segment that we do. It's called, right. it's called uh, Who Would You Rather Play in the First Round of the Playoffs? <laughs> the Kings, the Warriors, the Pelicans, or the Lakers? Well, the, lucky, the, the good thing for us is that we know we're either playing the Lakers or the Pelicans. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. tonight. They have their playing game. 
down in New Orleans tonight. And um, we're going to, I like to play whoever wins that game. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah, that's smart. That's, that, good. that's, that's what, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good answer. Good <laughs> that's answer. a good answer. Good Thank answer. You. Yeah. yeah no, that's good the best answer, answer we've good ever answer. had in that segment. Yeah. All right. So I had a couple of uh, last questions. Um, so we're ball knowers. We know ball. Uh, and these West playoffs are going to be great. There's so many talented teams. The one seed, though, the Thunder, they have had an incredible season. Some people, non-ball knowers, are being like, well, they're too young. They don't know how to get through the playoffs. Uh, we obviously know that they're so talented. They could Any team could win the West. Uh, well, playing them, though, and seeing like their young talent kind of go from, you know, they were not a playoff team last year, now they're in the playoffs. Obviously, that had to do with a lot of injuries, guys coming back. But how like how impressive is it watching a team that young? I think their their roster age is like twenty three years old. It's pretty crazy. Oh, it really is. And one, you have to give credit to Sam Presti, their GM, who's done a terrific job of, you know, handling the roster and 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 building that roster up to what we see today. Very young, but very talented. A lot of high lottery picks in there, uh, and it's not just about bringing talent in. They brought talent in that fits, that complements each other. Then you go down to Mark Dagnall, who I think is coach of the year in the NBA. I think he's done an outstanding job of building that team on both ends of the floor. Um, and then you mentioned the players. I mean, Shea Gil Gilgis Alexander is an MVP candidate for a reason. Unbelievable talent, uh, can score the ball, can guard. I think he led the league in steals. Uh, you have Chet Holmgren, who unfortunately is not a rookie class with Victor Wembanyama, but Chet Holmgren, we, we look at his upside and his ability to impact offense and defense. Uh, young Jalen Williams, that guy is just, he's becoming a go-to player for him. He'll be a future all-star in my opinion. Lou Dort's one of the best defenders yep. in the NBA. And, and I, th I give a guy like Josh Giddy so much credit. There was so much noise around him early in the year with the investigation, all the stuff off the court. He was being booed in every arena he played in. And he, he, he fought through that. And I think he's quietly a really important piece to that team because he can play make, he rebounds, he defends, and he makes all of his teammates better. So I don't buy into the whole, they're too young to win it. Yeah. Uh, last year, people thought, oh, well, we've never won a championship. They can't win a finals. And I go back to year one. We beat the Spurs in round one, and we took the Blazers to a game seven in the second round. It's uh, They have the talent. They have the coaching. And I think these Western Conference playoffs are just going to be so fun to watch. I, I would not be surprised if there are a ton of upsets. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to be crazy to watch. H have you have you done any, uh, any breakdowns or even thought, allowed yourself to think about the best teams in the East? Or are you just in the mindset of let's handle our business in the West? Yeah, I mean, I'm just locked in in the Western Conference. The funny thing is, going into our game against Memphis, game 82, all the games in the West started at the same time. And I knew all the different, like, oh, this team wins or this seed. In the East, I knew Boston was one, and after that I had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it's going to be hard enough getting out of the first round this year. Uh, so I, we're going to take it one round at a time. And if we're able to get out of the Western Conference again, then we'll turn our attention to whoever is coming out of the Eastern Conference. Yeah. All right. So I had one last question. It's a rowback question. RHOBACK.com. Promo code TAKE. 20% off your first purchase. Q-zips, polos, hoodies, joggers, shorts, everything. Rowback.com. Promo code TAKE. So we talked about the Hurleys. Have you thought about maybe uh, getting on the court and pushing a player during action? Uh, no. No. Uh, <laughs> Did Danny do that? Yeah, he did yeah. that in the finals with like when they were up 15 with three minutes left. He just kind of blacked out and he, he he pushed Cam Spencer to be like go and go and run the play. Uh, have you ever caught yourself getting too too far onto the sideline? Shaka Smart does it as well, where he's basically a six guy out there playing defense in the corner. But have you ever had to like stop yourself and be like, oh, I'm I'm basically standing on the court right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, sometimes I'm like. Uh... You know, the, the scene in old school, I'm having an out-of-body experience, man. And I find myself like, why am I on the other side of half court uh, you know, coaching my team? Years ago, Terry Stotts, who was coaching in Portland at the time, he took a screenshot of our game, and I was all the way on the other side of the court in the other coaching box. Uh, and sometimes my wife will and my daughters will make fun of me because as the game is going on, I am – that's why I like – we don't have to wear suits anymore. Yeah. I can – 
I can get in a defensive stance <laughs> and do my slide up and down the sideline like I'm guarding, like I'm having any impact on the game. But- no, it does. That does. That absolutely has an impact. The coach getting yeah. up and, and and slapping the floor a couple times, That's that absolutely has an impact. I, I think the players probably laugh at it, but I think they respect it. I'm not a guy – like there are certain coaches that you look on the sideline, they'll be over there sitting on the bench with their legs crossed. Yeah. And, I, and I, I actually said to my assistants, if I ever sit on a bench with my legs crossed, punch me in my face. Yeah. I said, <laughs> I am a coach. I'm into the game. It's an emotional game. And, uh, you know, you're, we're all competitors, man. You don't get to this level if you're not a competitor. And, you know, sometimes I definitely overdo it. And uh, I got to remind myself to, to calm down a little bit. But at the end of the day, like my mother always tells me, you got to be yourself. And that's what I try to do. Yeah. yeah. Maybe if you just get one technical, then have, have the Jokic brothers be your get back guy. And so yeah. if you get too far out there, they come down, they grab you back. Well, that was one of my best uh, moments last year of winning the Western Conference Finals yeah. at the NBA was going to hug Nemanja and Strahina, Nikola's big brothers and really big brothers, and them taking me like a rag doll and throwing <laughs> me in the air. And – uh, I mean, th- th- those are moments that you'll never, ever forget. And that's what I love about our group. You know, it's, it's not just our players, but we have a very connected group, and uh, I love being a part of it. Well, hopefully you get some more of those moments uh, coming up in the next couple of months. Coach, we really appreciate your time. We love having you on, and uh, best of luck in the playoffs. And let's let's not wait a whole year if you guys win again. Yeah. Let's have you on right away. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe at the parade we'll have you, we'll have you zoom in uh, at the parade if it happens again. I tell you what, that would be awesome to do. If not, I will see you guys in Chicago. And uh, always being uh, great being on with you guys, and uh, let's do it again soon. All, All right. right. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. And we'll, we'll, don't worry. We'll yeah. police anyone who says Mike. We yep. got you. We got your back. We're your, I yeah, love it. we're your silent protectors. We, we got, got you. you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Coach Malone was brought to you by Part of My Cheesesteak. It's a pickup and delivery only restaurant bringing you craveable cheesesteaks, tenders, loaded fries, desserts. Yeah, lunch, dinner, late night snacks, anything you want. Choose from the expanded menu. It's got regular cheesesteaks, Chipotle cheesesteaks, Chipotle chicken, buffalo chicken, chicken bacon ranch cheesesteaks. Order the Big Cat Combo. Get your cheesesteak of choice, fries, and a drink. Or you can get the Mac Special, two sodas. With more than 1,500 locations nationwide, find a Pardon My Cheesesteak near you. Order yours now at PardonMyCheesesteak.com or through Uber Eats. Use code PMC20. For 20% off your order at participating locations, that's promo code PMC20 for 20% off your order at participating locations. Okay, we'll wrap up the show with Firefest. I'll actually go first this week with my Firefest because it's the fact that we have a gambling turtle that's going to probably cost me a lot of money. Well, he's 0-1 right now. 0-1. I want I wish, to know on the money line. I wish there was some sort of metaphor, though, Big Cat, for um, something like Kid's Fable that started out mm. very slow. Reminded us that this was a marathon, not a sprint. Okay, so I have to stick with Mr. Perry you're saying? He might he might be the money line guy. We don't know. We might have gotten accidentally a money line turtle. Tortoise. Tor tort is it tortoise? He's a tort Russian tortoise. All tortoises are turtles. So is that we, true? Can we say That's tor- Max told me. So oh well Max. Jesus. Max told he's, you that. He's a, he's a All tortoises guy. are turtles? Well, where'd you find that out? All tortoises No, no, no. Oh, He's got oh, all tortoises are turtles. Not all turtles are tortoises. So he's a tortoise, but a, also a turtle. So that might have been the turtle pick. Oh, that he did yesterday. He's looking so cute, Mister he, Pear. He's very gorgeous, Mister Pear. What's on his mouth? Yeah, he's looking. It's calcium. He a, he's got a lot of white calcium? stuff on his mouth. What has he been doing? He's been drinking milk. No, no, it's, it's calcium powder. They they need it to for the shell. Wait, so did you put that on him? No, you put it on his food, and then... Oh, no way. Yeah. Look at you, Memes. He looks like a Coke guy. Memes is really... He's we, doing a great job as a zo- papa. Zoom in on his face and just make the I fucking love cocaine meme out of him. Look at this guy. Why do you have a... <coughs> excuse me. Why do you have a jersey underneath? Did he poop on you? And come on you? I, apparently, that's what their pee looks like. Is white? <laughs> okay. And what if it's a, a female tourist and that was squirt? We don't know if he's male or female. Yeah. It's a mister. Oh, you've 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 checked it? Nope. Oh, okay, so we don't know. Uh all right, so that's my fire for us is that whatever this turtle picks, I'm going to bet. And we've somehow gotten ourselves back into this situation where a turtle is now deciding whether I win or lose money. 
He's going to be good. Yeah. All right. So he's going to pick the Bulls Heat game. Hank, why don't you go with your Fire Fest while Mr. Pear picks? No real Fire Fest for me. I mean, the sleeping, sleeping the other day, dozing off, not great. Yeah, especially uh, after you slept until 11.30 on last Thursday. Yeah, I might have a sleep problem. Well, I've just been waking up early, which I think is a good thing long term. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. He's not Pear's moving not at all. Moving. <laughs> He's taking his time. He's not moving. All right, Hank, you just let us know. Keep going with your fire. I'm just addicted to uh, uh, watching old Masters broadcasts before I go to bed, and I that that's been keeping me up. What have you been watching? Have you, have you seen Scotty Stradler? No, no Craig I've been, Stradler. Craig, 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 Stad- I've, Craig I've, Stadler. I've yeah. been like 2002. I'm, I've been I'm. It's they're four hour broadcasts, but I'm like I'll just turn this on and fall asleep, and I I watch for like two hours. You get really into it. Yeah. You are addicted to golf. The there it's good. It's good. It's a good watch. Join. He's Jim Nance. <laughs> he hasn't moved. He has not moved, folks. <laughs> not one. He has not moved. Side of movement. I think we can put any do- down for him. Though. If he doesn't move by the end of the Fire Fest, we have to just do a uh, game to go to overtime. Yeah, so w- wait. Why don't we put food down? Yeah, put some food down. He's not going to move if there's Or no Max, food. just show show him your ass. All right, so no Fire, fire Fest is just Hank's watching too much golf. Yeah. Okay. okay. PFT? Good Fire Fest. Um, my fair fest, kind of along the same lines of, of also taxes. I did file. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like to clear for the record. Uh, mm-hmm. Why were people asking? Yeah, well, people were chirping me and like they're saying like I'm gonna get audited and shit. Like I take the most out of my taxes so that I don't have to do you know, taxes. Not do taxes, but like so it's not you know it's not like oh fuck I'm gonna be down. Oh here he's moving. He's going okay. to the heat. Oh no, Where he's going? going to the heat. He might. He only turns right so far. Yeah, we're gonna have to figure this problem out. He's not an ambi turner. Okay, keep going, Hank. So you did your taxes, even though you did them late. I did. They're on. They're on the way. Well, we're we're good. What's today's date? Uh, it's the eighteenth. Oh, do you owe money? I will owe money, but not. You know, I'm not gonna get like. They were late. Go to jail. Okay. And if I have to pay a fine, I pay a fine. Uh, all right, PFT. What's yours? Uh, along the same lines as just the tortoise that stinks at gambling. I've. I tried to do something good and tried to get some advice and learn from experts on tortoises so we can find out more about our beloved Mr. Pear. And I signed up for an account on tortoise forums. Okay. And a lot of hot discussion going on on tortoise forums, tortoises in the news, advanced tortoise topics. And I I made a post there under advanced tortoise topics asking for advice with a gambling tortoise because I assume this is a problem they've dealt with in the past. Yeah. They know which types are good, which types are not good. I got banned from Tortoise Forum. What? They hit me with a ban hammer. The mods came after me after about, I, it was one post. You're, you're the John Tay Porter of Tortoise Forum. And I, I specifically said, we're not doing weird sex stuff with them because I know a lot of those freaks on the That's Tortoise smart. message boards smart. are into weird sex stuff. Yep. You let that be and known. I let that be known. And I had uh, uh, several real questions <laughs> about the tortoise. And then they hit me with a ban hammer right off the bat. So I am, I'm. No longer blocked by OJ, but I am banned by Tortoise Forum. Wait, OJ unblocked you? No, he's dead, so he's right. No, but he's not blocking his account? me. Account? No, but he can't. You he can't be blocking me if he's dead. But his account still blocks. The, the account still blocks me. Yeah, we got to get that fixed. I no, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. okay. I wear that as a badge. But the Tortoise Forum thing is it's a real issue because we are going to have questions about it, and that's the place to go to get your questions answered. I'll sign up. There's yeah, you should. Yeah, I'll and do then it for and you. then do a little like yeah, intro like, post hey, about just yourself. Just so you know. Yeah. Um, also, Not trying to have sex with any turtles. No sex stuff. We've been very clear about that. Maybe uh, I'll say, listen, guys, uh, I'm not trying to have sex with my turtle. He also is a tortoise. We're not going to talk about that part. Yeah. Just let everyone know. Yeah. I, are separate. I looked around on the forum, though, and there's some great, great topics. Like, what did your tortoise do during the eclipse? It was a hot one. Mm. That was in the advanced topic section. He's what turning, is turning back to the middle. He's turning. Oh. He's 50 He's turning. He's trying to escape. Trying to escape. I think he's leaving. Yeah, he's leaving. This guy, Mr. Pear, he is he's got a problem. Oh. I mean, we we can do, if, oh. he, if oh. he leaves, we can say oh. no pick. He's looking he's at the bulls. bulls. He's like sixty percent bulls right now. Okay. All right. All right. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really have a, a fire fest other than Mr. Pear. You want to do a Taylor Swift album review? Yeah. Uh, Crash. It's, wait, no, yeah, actually, no, really I don't, because it isn't officially out yet, right? But it's it's out by the time this is released. But Swifties have been very upset about leaks. Oh. They've been doxing each other. They've been infighting in the Swifties. Well, I did I did hear one song that I did not care for on the album. Okay. It talks. So wait, you listened to it before it came out? No, so I was forced to listen to it. Okay. okay. I was forced to listen to it. Are there any music who? videos? No, I was somebody kidnapped me and they said you have to listen to this. I said no, Taylor's Queen. 
let's not take away from her streams. Yeah. Did, is there any videos I could watch? I don't have any videos of it. Okay. Just well, let yet. me know when it's in video form. There is. I've heard that there might be a very interesting video of her and somebody else. Oh. Um, but I'll be watching. There's one song that I don't like at all, and I don't think anyone should listen to. It's about how her boyfriend's friend is super annoying and always trying to get him to schedule things oh. and trying to get him to stop coming to her concerts, trying to get him out to drink beers and just carry on and be a big psycho yeah. dumb jock. Don't and, listen to that. And that's not who her boyfriend is, but he has one bad, really bad influence of a friend that's very unorganized. Yeah. Okay. So whatever that song's about, I don't like it. Yep. Agreed. Uh, Jake, finish us off. Is he just not moving He's again? He's not moving. He's in the middle. It might be a no pick. Or we could just keep it he's running. He's facing the Bulls, but he's in the dead center. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep him going. Come on, Mr. Bear. Come on, Mr. Bear. Can't rush greatness. All right, Jake, what's your first? Uh, the other day, I was walking back from the grocery store, and it started pouring. Right in the middle of the walk. Oh. Uh -huh. I didn't know you liked to get wet. We did no. have a crazy, a couple crazy weather days. Thanks, Hank. Oh, that's uh, our, 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 our baseball game got canceled. Yeah, but it was like there was one day where it was Softball. It was raining, then 70 degrees and raining again. It's nice little... It's like Florida. Mix it up. Mm -hmm. The weather's been fine. It's been fucking 70. No, there's just one day, day where. Oh, a yeah. little rain. Oh, a yeah. little rain. You, did you just do your Mr. Pear voice to me? <laughs> oh, a little rain. I'm excited for your softball team. I want to play. I also think Hank is not going to be a good pitcher. He's not taking it seriously. What? I asked who was pitching, and they everyone was like, I don't know. And then it seems like you're pitching. I'll, I'm going to come and. and I'm going to come. Don't I'm going to come. Don't come. And Max, are you the manager? Pug. Or the Pug's the manager? We're the team. Pugs. Pug, yeah. will you, will there be a short hook on Hank if he's not throwing strikes? Yeah, well, it's a zero tolerance policy. Love yeah. that. Yeah. All right, I'll be ready. I'm gonna, I, well, it's you know, softball, so they're going to get hit. Like, if it's strikes fine. is one thing, I, I'm fine with that. But Well, no, if you don't throw strikes, they're just going to walk on no, you. No, I'm saying that's fine. Yeah. If we're giving up runs, that's, there's nothing I can do. That's my field. Yeah. I don't know about It's that. softball. Sounds like you're okay with getting shelled. Yeah. Sounds like you're giving up meatballs. It's softball. I Sounds like no you're choice. throwing it too slow. I have no choice. We'll see. It's, it's game zero. Cut me some slack. All right. I'm going to show up in a big uh, starter jacket with just over my right arm. I'll be ready. Uh, maybe I'll stand. Maybe I'll just sit in my car. We should find out. Hey, waiting. <laughs> we should find out what teams are playing against Hank, and then we should get you in the starting lineup for one of those teams. Just take just, take, take pitches. Hank, take pitches. Hank, take him yard. Yeah. No, just take pitches. Walks are way more embarrassing. It's Crowd the plate. Oh. Oh. Is he going? going? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> he popped his head out. I okay. saw. So I found. I found how you can tell the difference between a male and a female tortoise online. Should Should we check? Yeah. Maybe he doesn't like the food that's being presented. I don't know. What is it? Lettuce? Let's check next time he does a pick because he's already he's in the middle of a pick right now. We can't rush this. Yeah. This might take a while. Uh, all right. Should we do numbers? And then you just want someone just want to stay with the camera and we can just have our pick be whenever he decides. Yep. And maybe maybe Max or Meme say what the pick is after we do numbers so people who are listening can get the pick. That's fair. All right. Numbers. Oh, he's walking towards the bulls. Eight. Go, Mr. Pear. Go, Mr. Pear. Oh. oh. Go, Mr. Pear. Go, Mr. Pear. He's going. Oh, that's a big he's move. He's hauling he's, ass. he's doing it. He's doing it. And bulls. Yes, bulls. bulls. Let's, Let's go. go, Mr. Pear. Let's go, Mr. Pear. Mr. Pear. Not a Get heat some lettuce. Guy. Yeah, fuck the heat. That was actually good to know that he can go the other way. Yeah. And he... He was very torn on it. He actually probably, you can probably put in the graphics when he found out that Jimmy Butler was out. Because oh, he started yeah. going to the heat. Yeah, he's eating. Yes, Mr. Pear. Mr. Pear. I love you, Mr. Pear. All right, numbers. 840. I'm going to go 73 for Mr. Pear. 61 plus 12 is the, 61, 12 is the uh, number for a turtle. 61 plus 12, 73. 20. 20 for Max. 18. 3. He's hungry. 99, Pope. He just Jeez, ate. Are you? F are you? I, yeah, I just fed him. He's supposed to eat one time a day. He did, all, he did all that coke. He's not hungry. Max, we should go on the Mr. Pear diet. Seventy-nine. Love you guys. Is Mr. Pear? 